Yeah. Oh, man, this place is packed. That it is. Standing room only. I love it. Stand, front porch, back porch. There's probably people standing outside pretending they know what we're going to say. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. Uh, I'm Matt Deloney. Joining them this week, very special guest, no illusions from the scathing atheist, god-awful movies, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gotta say, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, Matt. They, they reached out to me not too long ago, and they're like, hey, you want to do the show with Noah? And I was like, well, we had a rule about, you know, hair length. <laughs> you, you had to be bald with a goatee if you're going to be on the show, but, right, you know, nice. I'll make an exception. All right, all right, glad to hear it. We're really thrilled that Noah's here, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. There's our, The calls, all, the lines are all full, uh, the house is packed, I have a couple announcements to make, and then I have something important to me to talk about Uh so here we go. Uh, the Godless Bitches and Atheist Vanguard will be down at the Women's March on January 19th. Also, the January newsletter is out. You can find out more information at the Atheist Community of Austin's uh, Facebook page and other social media stuff. Uh, that'll tell you a lot about what's going on in the community. And believe me, there's a lot going on. Not only do we have nine different programs and growing, uh, but also the library here is open every day from 10 to 9, uh, 1507 West Candy Lane. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come down, visit. It. You can check out some of the books because, yes, in fact, this is actually a library. Uh, you can see the studio where we do stuff. And if you're here on Sundays or Saturdays or Thursdays or whatever day we're doing a show, uh, you can sit in the studio audience and interact with the hosts before and after the show. There's a lot going on here at the ACA, and I couldn't be happier about it. Not the least of which is that we have our special guest here today. And I'm going to let Noah steer the show right after this. <clears throat> So the other day, I was uh, in a conversation with a friend of mine, and she says, hey, you should see the tweet that I just posted. And I was like, okay, and I went over and looked at the tweet, and it was a nice tweet. It was, uh, you know, her standing there in a shirt that said, always smile, and then she, of course, lifts up the shirt and shows her breasts and said, have a great evening. And I said, I should retweet that. And she goes, you should. So I did. And then some people lost their minds. <sighs> Now, there were people who immediately thought, you know, hey, Matt's been hacked. Well, here I am. I wasn't hacked. Uh, I do realize it was out of character for me to post something like that. When I retweeted it, I included, you know, NSFW just so that it, people would know it's not necessarily safe for work. I wasn't just trying to shovel, you know, porn your direction. Um, but the responses were amusing. The two of us sat there on, on Skype and kind of read things as they, they came in. And, and a lot of it we laughed about. But there were some things that were very disturbing. So I wanted to address that fairly quickly at the start of the show. Yes, there are people in my life who are important to me who are sex workers. Ooh. You know what else? There's probably people in your life who are important to you who are also sex workers, but you might not know it because you're a pretentious douche who likes to shame people for the jobs that they do. Now, some of the things that, that came in, they were like, oh, it's a midlife crisis, Matt's middle-aged, and here he is posting stuff with some young escort. Uh, if this is a crisis, give me crisis all the fucking time. Uh, there are real issues that need to be addressed. I mean, I realize people have different views about pornography and sex work, and some of them stem from some very real concerns about the risks inherent in some of those jobs, about, um, you know, what society's view of those things are, about safety issues. But it's the moral question that really got to me, because... I'm part of the secular community. I've advocated for secular humanism. I've advocated for individual freedom. I'm a sex-positive individual. I support the notion that people should be free to do whatever they feel like doing as long as they're doing it responsibly. And that should be the critical issue. And it really bothered me that a portion of the secular community seems to be some pearl-clutching, hand-wringing, moralizing, puritanical jackasses uh, that decide it's okay to just shame people for stuff. So I posted the pic, and here's some things for you to consider. Why is it okay for me to post a picture of my nipple, but not a woman's nipple? Think about that for a while, because that's part of the problem here. Now, there were questions that, that came in. Somebody said, well, this isn't a profession that you'd want your daughter to do. Oh, really? Well, thank you for proving that you don't know me at all, because it doesn't matter what I would want my daughter to do. What matters is what my daughter wants to do. And if she's a responsible human being who wants to engage in sex work, and by the way, somebody said, is sex work a euphemism for prostitution? No, prostitution is one in the broader category of sex work. It includes porn stars, escorts, call girls, uh, phone sex workers, it, nude pictures, whatever. 
This is a broad range. And it's, human sexuality is something that is important to all of us, even to people who are asexual and may not even care about sex. It is still a component of who we are, and those people need to be recognized as well. And as soon as you start running around shaming people for something or assuming that your little personal baggage should apply to everybody else, you've made a horrible mistake. Somebody else said, well, would you want your wife to do this? My wife did do this. Uh, hello. I'm sure that's a surprise to a number of you. And yes, I talked to her beforehand and let her know I was going to say that. But that's the point. A lot of people don't talk about the fact that they've done things like this before or that they are doing them now because they are terrified of the response that they're going to get from people who care about them and people who they care about. This goes on. By the way, when you ask, hey, you wouldn't want your daughter to do this, why didn't you ask whether or not I would want my son to do it? Because sex work is not limited to women. This isn't a let's protect the women and children and run for the hills thing. Sex affects all of us. And I think that some of the objections that I've heard are like, well, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a great job. There's lots of problems with it. Uh, there's people doing it who don't like those jobs. Yes, there are. Um, I've had friends and I've had intimate partners who were both sex workers or previous sex workers. I've known people who had no business working in that industry, were, seemed to be uh, not necessarily forced into it, but you know, out, out of a lack of options, they did that work and they hated it. And I have helped some of them actually get out of that work and get into other jobs that they like better. But that's true for people who join the military. There are people who join the military because they have no other options. There are people who join the military because in a little bit of legal trouble, and in the court proceeding, they reached a plea bargain where instead of going to jail, you would have to go in the military. There are a lot of shitty jobs out there. There are people who hate their jobs all over the planet. There are jobs that are risky. There are jobs that are dangerous. I think sex workers should be put up there on a pedestal in the same way that we do with military because they are performing an essential function. And as long as they're doing it as responsible human beings, where we are considering issues of consent, where we are setting appropriate boundaries, where we are exercising cautionary safe sex, and where we are keeping people from taking other actions that it might be worse, that should be applauded. Now, somebody said they lost respect for me when I retweeted that. Fine. I'm, <laughs> I'm thrilled. Um, I, I, I asked them why. Why would you lose respect for me? They didn't answer, so already they showed that they really aren't thinking about this. But here's the thing. There are big problems in the world. I want the secular community to be better at dealing with those, and that means we need to get rid of some of the baggage. And there are people out there who are still hanging on to this baggage from puritanical, religious, moral systems that make it so that they cannot look at these issues fairly. And as long as that's going on, it inhibits our ability to have conversation, it inhibits our ability to uh, affirm people's actions and choices and say, you know, yes, if this is what you in fact want to do, I'm supportive of you. And if it's something you don't want to do, I'm supportive of that decision as well. But until we get past this, we can't really deal with the issues of how do we go about legalizing? How do we go about regulating? How do we go about making sure that there's not sex trafficking? We can't deal with those issues because there are a bunch of people who still have a big stick up their butt. And so I'm going to recommend that you pull the stick out of your butt, replace it, replace it with a baby Jesus butt plug. <laughs> And get over yourself a little bit and realize that other people's choices aren't necessarily yours. When we shame people for what they do, especially if it's people who are doing it responsibly, who are wanting to do this, we do a disservice to the entire community. And so, yeah, for those people who are, oh, Matt, Matt knows sex workers? Yeah, I know lots of them. Uh, Many of them are great people. Some of them don't want to be in that job, but a good chunk of them do. And I'm not going to slut shame anybody, just like I'm not going to fat shame anybody, just like I'm not going to age shame anybody, because I'm not a jackass. And I would hope, well, I am on occasion. Well, I'm likely to be a jackass here a little bit. <laughs> but I would hope that we can all do better and realize that just because you don't like something doesn't mean you're right and doesn't mean you should be imposing that on other people. So yes, I sent out the tweet. Yes, I'm dating someone who's an escort. Yes, I've had intimate relations with other people who are sex workers. Uh, you can clutch your pearls and go post your videos about how awful I am and I will continue to enjoy my life with other responsible people. Amen, sir. Thank you. And, and you know, I'd like to add to that, how do you even get there from a secular worldview? Right, because I understand how Christians get there because they think sex is evil and terrible and bad. But if you take that away, then how how is sex work shameful in any way? Why would that be any different than working at Burger King or or, or any other thing? Right, it's way better than working. Well, yeah, at, you make a lot days. more money. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny because if you take a look at history, uh, at different times, sex has had a different level of acceptance, and sex work particularly, where you know. Some, in some cases and sometimes it was just like, hey, it's a de facto, oh, she's working as a prostitute or he's working as a rent boy thing, whatever. 
it's we, we tend to be riding this wave of let's have a massive backlash and say that, oh, this is dirty or, or problematic. And I get it. If you don't want to do it or you don't like it, I mean, that, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, it was just surprising. And, and by the way, yes, I got really irritated at some of the comments, but not some of the others. We, we literally sat there, she and I were Skyping, and we're like laughing and going, wow. Uh, it didn't take long for some people to like really run off the deep end. Mm-hmm. Oh, you wouldn't want your daughter to? Yeah, whatever. Uh, right. Well, and the other thing too is I think a lot of secular people fail to recognize that even once they le- leave religion or even if they've never been in religion, that religious attitudes about sex still infect our culture, yep. whether or not you, you, you know, whether or not you are religious, you're still affected by the way that people act about it. And we've just got to be better than that. You know, we have to go back to first principles and ask, okay, if this is immoral, why? Yeah. You know, give me a good argument. Yes. Ed. I'm waiting to hear it. Me too. And also, by the way, if you're offended by nipples. <gasps> I saw a great post on Facebook the other day that had a picture in it uh, with a finger point to it. Say, this is a male nipple. Anytime you want to post a picture of a woman's breast, <laughs> right. just cut and paste this male nipple over there and you'll be just fine. Yeah. And I thought that was fucking brilliant. But <laughs> So yesterday I, uh, I hopped in the truck and I drove three and a half hours to Dallas uh, and three and a half hours back in order to, to see a two-hour show. Uh, <laughs> With, with you and Ethan Eli doing god awful movies, and I loved it just like I have the other times I've seen it. Uh, how is that? How did that come about, and how much fun are you guys having with it? Well, I'll tell you, you know, the only part of my job that I don't like is the part where I actually have to watch Christian movies. And for those of you who aren't aware of the show, uh, we we have a show uh, called God Awful Movies where every week we break down another Christian movie and, and, and we we tear apart the bad acting, we tear apart the bad writing, but we also tear uh, apart the bad ideas uh, that undergird these things. Um, and it actually came out of a segment that we did on Scathing Atheist um, uh, when God's Not Dead came out. Right. Uh, this was before Eli was part of our show and he calls me up. He's like, he, he, we've been friends for years. He calls me up and he's like, I so want to review this movie on your show. And I was like, oh, make that happen. And it was one of the most fun things that we had ever done on the show. The audience loved it, so we brought him back to do a couple more, and after a while, we were just like, okay, this has got to spin off as its own show. Uh, so we've been doing it for a little over three years now. Uh, you would think, uh, if you didn't know too much about Christian cinema, that after 178 shows, we'd be running out of movies, but no. Nope. Not even close. I think we've got another four years worth just on our existing list. And they keep coming out with them. So. I tell you what, if you get the if you get the chance, if God Off Movies comes to your town for a live show, uh, watching the live show is an experience that you can't quite get from just listening to the podcast, <laughs> um, and it's highly recommended. But for those of you who, who fit into the moralizing pearl clutching, <laughs> you, you should probably not. No, uh, but buy a ticket anyway, and then you can tell people you went, and they'll think you were cool when you're really not. <laughs> <laughs> I endorse that wholeheartedly. Uh, so for years now, I, I've seen you guys do this live. I think last night was probably the third time, uh, once at a convention, once here in Austin, once in Dallas. Uh, and there are recurring themes and jokes. And yet every time I think that I, I know what's going to be coming next, one of you will do something that I almost peed my pants <laughs> last night. Uh, <laughs> In, in part because of Eli and Wolverine, but I'm going to save that. Um, when you guys are watching the movie, you watch them individually. You don't yeah. sit in a group room. And so everybody takes notes on their own about, you know, what we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. I, this is something that somebody thinks, well, you know, I could do this on my own. I can go and lampoon a thing. And you probably could. Mm-hmm. I mean, but the fact that there are three different brains that watch this, that come up with stuff, and then you guys work together... And, and put this, I think there's insights that are never going to happen unless you have multiple people looking at that. Absolutely, yeah. Because, you, you know, you think of, you know, we, you and I can hear the, the same argument and you're going to go one direction with it, I'm going to go another. We're both going to be right in our assessment of it, but there's no reason uh, to, to go any further once, you, once you've refuted it, right? You, you don't continue to think about other ways to refute it necessarily. So, yeah, but, and, and also we come from very different directions. Uh, I've got two co-hosts. Uh, e- Eli, is, uh, his, his history is in entertainment. He's a magician. He's a comedian. Uh, he went to NYU to study acting. So he can, you know, break it down from the perspective of a filmmaker, of an actor, et cetera. Uh, my other co-host, Heath, he was a political science major, went to Williams College, very educated guy. 
guy. Um, so he tends to come to it from a much more intellectual perspective. And I'm just an angry guy, and I come to it from the perspective of a frustrated atheist. So, yeah, we all bring a little something different to the show, I guess. There's a copy of, of your book at the table last night, Diatribes, I think it's volume two or mm -hmm. whatever. And I... I have diabetes. And so when I walked past the table, I looked down and instead of diatribes, I just saw the word diabetes. And I was like, why is Noah writing about <laughs> diabetes? Uh, so lots of stuff. Go ahead and give them some websites where they can find out where to get in touch with you guys, how to buy merch, how to find out tickets for the show and everything else. And then we'll dig in on callers. Um, yeah, I'd say the best place you can go is uh, we, we do a lot of stuff on, on our Facebook pages. So if you check out Scathing Atheist on Facebook, that'll be uh, the, the best way to connect with the, what's most current. You can also check out scathingatheist.com if you want to check out the archives, or out awful movies.com. Uh, and... Um, yeah, and, and then also, I, I, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd also like to plug a charity yes. that we work with quite Absolutely. a bit. Uh, there's a charity that we work with called Modest Needs. Every year we do a, uh, a fundraiser called Vulgarity for Charity. Um, as atheists, you know, we don't want to leave too much good in the world. We want to balance it out. So what we do is we have uh, our audience donate money to this charity. It's a really great charity. It's a crowdfunding uh, charity for... for uh, people who are on the brink of poverty to help them. You know, it's it's always one thing that knocks you into poverty, right? M many of us, if not most of us, live right on the edge of that and we're, you know, two missed paychecks away or one broken down car away uh, from poverty at any given time. So Modest Needs tries to get to people before that happens. It's a great charity. It's a secular charity. There's no religious affiliation. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is we will trade a donation for an insult. Right, so if you want somebody in your life insulted, whether it's you know just a, a playful insult of yourself, or maybe you've got a senator who grew a beard, but we still know he's a blobfish underneath <laughs> all of it, or something like that, that you like uh, uh, roasted, we we will be happy to do that. You know, we did this, we've done this for uh, three years in a row. Uh, last year we set a goal of fifty thousand uh, dollars, and we raised a hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. Outstanding! Uh, because despite what people in the Christian world will tell you, atheists are some of the most generous and charitable people in the world, and we're just proud to prove that over and over again every year. Yeah, Eli reached out to me this year, and I, I immediately said yes. And then there were conflicts that arose, so I didn't get to uh, I didn't get to participate in it this year. But I will I'll definitely be around. Well, that's one of the things is that for years we hear that you know like theist and in particular Christianity have got the market cornered on charitable stuff. When when Phil is here, and Phil's in the building today, the, the person who volunteers more than anybody on the planet, it's always an opportunity to show what he's doing, what we're doing, what different organizations are doing. And yet, every almost it seems like every time we get a guest in, we talk about these things, somebody's got a charity that they want to help promote. I, I, I not only love the fact that we're doing it from a standpoint of changing people's perceptions about who we are, but we're legitimately doing good things. Mm -hmm. And here we are, like in the fourth week of a government shutdown, modest needs may have 800,000 new people <laughs> right. who uh, could use a little assistance. So by all means, check that out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to let you pick out where we start today on the calls. Well, I got to say, it looks like Jacob has a question that really gets to the heart of it all here. All right. Jacob in Portland, Oregon, you are on with Noah and Matt. Or not. Hello? Hey, Jacob, how are you? Hey, how you guys doing? I'm good. How are y'all? Doing well. Good. So uh, I had a question about uh, this humanism that I hear about a lot on the show. I've been listening for a while, and... Um, I'm coming from a street epistemology video, and uh, so I've been recently rethinking what I was brought up with, and uh, I see humanism as a a good way to come out of religion and still find community. But I'm, I, I'm still, I, I'll admit, I'm not real educated on the subject, mm -hmm. but yeah. interesting to me. But, uh, yeah, I guess I would start with, like, what is humanism I tell from you your guys' point of view? I have a whole video uh, from a lecture I did called The Superiority of Secular Morality and several others that deal with humanism. So if you want to hear my thoughts, you can do that. But I'm going to let Noah take this and dig in on why secular humanism is what it is and why it's better than Christianity. Um, well, I don't know that I'm, I, I, I've, I've got a good definition to give to you, but I can certainly answer the question of, of why I think it's better. And I think uh, more than anything, for, first of all, uh, when you start relying on uh, received wisdom, uh, y y you know, it's it's... 
it's static. It doesn't move as we learn more, right? So if your moral system is based on the Bible, you can almost think of that as an ethical anchor, right? Now, what you see through history, uh, through the history of Christianity, is people uh, occasionally updating the morals of Christianity, right? Like the the, the moral uh, dictums of Christianity circa 600 uh, CE are not remotely the same as as the ones of today. Uh, so what you see is periodically people sort of pick up that anchor and move it a little bit further, but it's still an anchor. It still holds us back. Whereas with secular humanism, you know, because it's not based on received wisdoms, because there's there are no absolutes within this, um, when when we learn more, we can rethink it and we can do it in real time. We can do it right away, you know. Uh, we don't have to uh, reinterpret a, a holy scripture and find a way to no longer have an issue with gay marriage, for example. Right, we can just right. move on as a culture, uh, and and you know without that, um, you know that a- appeal to antiquity holding us back. And it's not like you're gonna. There's no Bible 3.0 that says hey, right. we, we were wrong about <laughs> right. the gay thing. Yeah, for me, th- yeah. you know, I gave I gave a, a lecture, and there there are a lot of reasons why it's superior. But I think there's a really simple answer. Secular humanism is about humans and what's good for them, and Christianity is about Jesus and what's good for him. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of value, like we, we value humans, um, it is, do you think there's like, so if humanism is more, is morally superior to Christianity or, you know, mainstream religions than that, is that the highest tier or would you say like, no, is there a higher tier than veganism? Because I feel like, I mean, not veganism, that's where I'm getting to, but, uh, my my thing is like, if we value the earth and we value humans, why do we draw a line? Because I feel like every time you put an ism on the end of something, you're drawing a line. And what's wrong with drawing why lines? Do, why do we? Sorry. What's wrong with drawing lines? I mean, I I hear what I think is a baby in the background. You, have you got a baby or a child near you? Yeah, you I, care, do, I do. Do you care more about that child than you care about me? Uh, yeah, I do. Then you drew a line. That doesn't mean you don't care about me. The fact that I might care about you. It doesn't you. mean that. It, it doesn't, I, I cannot, I can care about you less and not, you know, control your life and exactly. take you hostage. And, I agree. I'm, and, I'm just making the point that the, I don't see any problem with necessarily drawing lines or putting things into, into categories. There's, so when I say humanism isn't necessarily the be all end all, I just mean now. I think the principles of humanism yeah. will carry forward such that anything that would be better would still be rolled up under secular humanism as we learn more about how the world works. And so, without digging in on on a, a broad, you know, vegan issue, um, there are certainly moral issues surrounding how and why we go about getting meat, um, and whether we should. And I don't think they're resolved. And I think that there's more to learn. Uh, and and secular humanism doesn't take a position. On, it's not like a secular humanism is a list of positions like thou shalt not or thou shalt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Secular humanism yeah. is about methods of what are the goals. And if the goal is to have a better world for us, there's nothing that says that excludes having a better world for other animals, for anything else. Yeah. No, I, I just think of it as like when you say a racist, you know, you're you're drawing a line at my race and then, you know, you, you exclude outside uh, clubs or whatever, you know. And a humanist kind of feels like you're doing that, like it's a species, this line that, doesn't really have a logical reason for stopping there. Well, it doesn't. It, it doesn't stop. It. It's the fact that I care more about humans than I do about grasshoppers uh, is yeah. probably because I'm a human, and I recognize that it's a bias. But I don't hate grasshoppers, and I'm trying to marginalize them. That's there's a difference when you're talking about bigotry that's based on race, gender, whatever. Um, that it, by and large, you're still talking within the group of humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you're saying is that there's no good reason for you to consider one thing more valuable than another or to devalue someone else uh, to the point that they, they yeah. don't count. And I get what you're saying, and I definitely think that there is something along the lines of this. It's just, so for example, when it comes to other animals, it's, yeah. I don't put all of them in the same category. It's not like humans and all other animals. My, my views on moral responsibility 
tie into a creature's ability to process and evaluate that moral responsibility, their ability to suffer. Like somebody the other day um, made a great point to me about uh, one of the reasons that they don't drink milk is because in order to do that, you basically have to remove a calf from the cow and keep it that way. And that causes uh, emotional distress to the cow. And that's probably true. And so then the question becomes, is that emotional distress that you're causing justified or outweighed by the benefits? And I'm not going to pretend to know. I'm just saying that yeah. there are issues there to consider. It's funny Wait, that... you have a stand? I'm sorry. No, it, it, I get a lot of calls and a lot of messages. Actually, it doesn't matter what video I post. I could post a video on right. promoting uh, and, and being sex positive, and somebody would come on and say, you need to talk about veganism every time <laughs> no, I, on the video. That's, that's not my angle, I, yeah. and I appreciate you know your point of view and all that, and that's why I'm giving you guys a call. I'm not no. trying to shame you guys. I want, but, I want to give Noah a chance to talk about this, too, because we may completely disagree. Well, you, you know... Yeah, he, no, he, I, uh, Oh, sorry. I, I don't mean to take your argument into a you know an ad absurdum uh, kind of position, but if you take, uh -huh. you know, if you don't draw the line at you, you, the line, must be drawn somewhere, right? Um, because otherwise, you end up with uh, you, you know these these Buddhist monks. I can't remember the, the the name of the particular sect that'll they walk around naked because they can't take the fibers from anything else, and they have to sweep the ground in front of them so as to not Are kill Jane any amoebas them, that Jane they step them? on. You're talking about Jains, yeah, Jains, yeah. They wear a mask over their face so they don't inhale an insect. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So if if you take this all the way, it, it obviously it becomes absurd. It becomes almost impossible uh, for humans to function without. You know, a, a larger society that's ignoring their moral precepts, kind of taking care of them. So we have to draw the line somewhere. Now, the great thing about uh, secular humanism is that, unlike a religious doctrine, uh, Matt and I and, and and you can we can all discuss where that line should be, and we can we can try to move that line. We can try to change each other's minds on it, and that's sort of the beauty of not having a received doctrine, right? Um, I have right. one of my co-hosts is a vegan, and and uh, he makes some really good arguments for veganism that. Uh, you know, and God, my best argument back to him is, but I like bacon. Yeah. Um, so is that is that Eli? Because I just yeah. started listening yeah. to your show too, and I thought that was a joke. I thought y'all were joking. No, like no. I mean, we 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 are, but no, he is really a vegan. Yeah. Um, oh wow, that's wonderful. And, and one of the, one of yeah. the things when we're talking about morality, and this is something I'll probably talk about at some other later time, there's a difference between a moral virtue and a moral responsibility. And essentially, a moral responsibility is you have to do this or you will be, you, you would have to evaluate yourself as immoral. But a moral virtue is something that you could do where you could claim a moral superiority, but not doing it doesn't mean you're immoral. And I fully recognize that when it comes to the, the issue of meat and veganism and stuff like that, um, someone who does not kill animals for food may in fact be more morally virtuous than someone who does kill animals for food. But that does not necessarily mean that the person who kills animals for food is violating a moral duty or moral responsibility and is therefore immoral. Does that make sense? Uh, it does, If like, but would you say that there's a... Uh hypothetical position where you think it would be okay to exploit a human being? I feel like that one might violate oh, yeah. humanism. Well, it, it, there are... So, so I guess the, the definition of the word exploit, you know, really has... Because, because we exploit each other all the time, right? So, it, you know, I... I Slave labor, like... No, I... I sorry, I thought I was... I thought you were saying if, if it would be in the context of eating someone. Like Noah and I are in a plane crash and we're at the top of the mountain and my legs are broken, I'm not going to have any way to escape and there doesn't appear to be any rescue. I'd be okay with Noah killing and eating me. Now, but that, right, yeah. that's also an issue of my, I mean, sorry, dude, but I'm yeah, gonna, but that, my body's going to be able to sustain you longer yeah. than your body's <laughs> right. going to be able to sustain me. Uh, yeah, and well, I'm considerably smaller than I was. Survival situations are incomparably different in everyday choices. But but one of the issues like, there that that does not, and I, by the way, before the vegans start emailing, yes, I realize that in that situation I am giving consent and that's not the same as that. Mm -hmm. I, there are no easy uh, solutions to this topic, but the key thing to, to, to address what your concerns were, humanism is not an ism in the sense of like white supremacy or white nationalism. It's not 
We oh. humans are the best thing ever, and we must only care for human beings, and all other animals must suffer and die for our existence. That's not what humanism is. <laughs> it's about let's find, the, let's make this the best of all possible worlds, and it's a process by which we learn uh, and test. And and one of the reasons that secular humanism, I, I've argued, is better than Christianity goes to what Noah is saying about revealed wisdom and holy books and passed down. It's about how they go about changing minds. And religions tend to go about changing minds by coercion, conversion, and conquest. And secular humanism's methods for changing mind is about discussion, debate, and data. And by the way, empathy. That's but right. That didn't yeah. start with and that's what's getting, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's what's persuading me outside of the path that I grew up on. And I found you guys, and y'all been a real inspiration. And, uh, you know, I'm changing gears. And, uh, but I'm also trying to remain like consistent and, and you guys seem really open-minded and, uh, you know, I, I see you guys get upset when people are like closed-minded and you know, not listening, but yeah, you guys are really, really open. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but oh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jacob, for calling. And, uh, yeah, well, hopefully you've, hopefully you've given yourself and everybody else more to think about or food. And while I was on hold, food. I heard some people ordering vegan food tonight. So y'all have fun. All right. <laughs> Good job. Oh, sorry. I hit the button a little too quick. Uh, yeah, the other day I, I had the Impossible Burger. Uh, mm -hmm. I went, uh, there's uh, Hop Dottie here in Austin is one of the places that has it. And people were like, oh, you should go try it. And it's an entirely plant-based burger. It's, it's slightly more expensive because they're still, you know, like, I don't know. They've got robots producing them in a factory somewhere. Right, right. Uh, it was good. Um, it on its own isn't enough to change my mind about you know, whether or not I'm going to go vegan. But these are questions that I'm still exploring and open to argument about. What I'm not open to is the the prodding, you know, if I post a video about Pascal's wager and somebody comes on and you need to reply to vegan so-and-so, <laughs> such-and-such, <laughs> and you're a meat-eating, meat, meat -eating, killing machine. And I, this one guy, uh, posed, when I posted about the Impossible Burger, I was really hoping that some people would say, glad you gave that a shot. I'm glad you liked it. Hopefully, you know, you... you you can go down this path. And while there were people that said that, there were also the, the vegans who despise me uh, mm -hmm. for positions I don't even hold who came on. And one guy was like, well, that fat ass would probably eat a dick if it had lettuce and mayo on it. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't like mayo at all. <laughs> Blocked. <laughs> Why? W were you putting lettuce and mayo on your dick in a hopes, you know? <laughs> uh, anyway. I've got some manners to wipe off. Give you one second. All right, keep going. Pick them out. All right. Well, we've got a Mormon. Those guys are always fun. Mm. Ben, and surprisingly, Ben is calling from where? Can the audience guess? Utah. Utah. Welcome to the show, Ben. You're on with Matt and Noah. Hey, thank you so much for taking my call. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, um, so I'm actually uh, questioning Mormon. I, I'm still in the faith. I'm actually a, a questioning Mormon. I've, I've grown up with it my whole life. I'm actually from New Mexico. Um, so, but the, my biggest, my biggest worry, so there's this, uh, charismatic, I live by, uh, the Salt Lake Temple, mm -hmm. uh, this charismatic, uh, preacher came and he, he's got a YouTube channel and, uh, I started, uh, exploring my beliefs actually a lot. Um, so I would listen to apologists. I would actually listen to you, Matt, or Aaron Raw, people like that. Aaron. Um, Call back. Aaron, sorry. It's all right. We, um, we did that. We did that like, or Noah did it like four or five times last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I went, I, I, there's just no rationality to Christianity to me at all. Um, and, uh, the just, most of it doesn't make any sense. I think you'll find but us I love both in violent people. agreement. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But I love, but I love people. I, I love morality. I love my family. I love Mormons. I love the people around me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can't shake this fear of hell because I know that a perfect God, if he was perfect, he wouldn't want anyone to suffer. Um, but I look at all these near death experiences where, um, they're recorded on YouTube and all these people and they're describing hell in such great detail. And it's, and I, and I, I've heard your talks, Matt, on, on hell. Mm -hmm. However, I, uh, if I, uh, I look at it and it's mostly Christianity on these near death experiences that, you know, flood and they're in great detail by 
intelligent men and things like that. And in Christianity, Mormon, like if you go uh, fundamentalist Christian, Mormonism is heresy. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it just, it's, it bothers me because I love my family and I love my friends and I love, I love Muslims and gay people. I'm friends with gay people. I'm friends with everyone. And it's, uh, if these near death, are you friends with black people too? Sorry, it's it's an yeah. easy joke. I do have one question. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Noah dig in on this, but do you worry that you're going to be abducted by aliens at all? No, of course not. And yet there are videos out there with people describing their abduction experience. So you might want to reflect on that. Of of you saw you see videos about people with their supposed near death experiences of hell, and that gives you pause. And yet you could watch videos of people being abducted by aliens, and that doesn't seem to have the same impact. Sure. So looking into what the difference between those two scenarios is and with regard to what what baggage you're bringing to those conversations that might be affecting how m much credence you put on those, uh, that's worth considering. What, I don't know, near-death experiences, threats of hell, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it, I'd be way more convinced by them if we found Hindus having a near-death experience where they wound up in Christian hell, right? It, 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 it's, it's just whatever you were brought up to believe culturally. Now, you have to keep right. in mind with these near-death experiences that largely what's happening is you have a person who, you know, was clinically dead for some amount of time, but then after that, they were unconscious for a really long time, right? Sure. We all know what happens when we're unconscious, right? And and we don't ascribe a whole lot, but some people do, but most of us don't ascribe a whole lot of meaning to a dream. And even when we do, we don't say we were there, right? Like I don't come wake from a dream and say, well, I was actually in the classroom in my underwear, you know? Um, but but right. yet because these dreams come after such a traumatic event and because they reaffirm things that largely people want to believe, we tend to give them a lot more credence. Whereas a Muslim near-death experience that you know was meant to bolster the words of Islam uh, we wouldn't give the same credence to, right? What do you say, if I can respond, what, what would you say uh, the, the main, they, they do actually, they, they make a big attempt on, um, pay, obviously they do a lot of editing and they try to incorporate a lot of pathos and things like that in these videos. Um, but it, what would you, what do you say to the, the Muslims that never believed in Christianity and got a near death experience and, seen Jesus and they saw glimpses of hell um, and then they changed and became Christian and Muslim countries, these type of, these type of videos. Are these I a have, good reason to think fabricated? Yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never encountered anything like that. I've never heard of anything like that. I have. I, I have you. Yeah, and it's one thing I was going to comment because I, I fully agree with what Noah said and I realize that there are a select few. Here's a Muslim who had a, an experience where they described an, essentially a Christian hell or a Hindu who did something along the same lines. Um, it would be very impressive if you found me a Muslim who had never heard anything at all in their entire life about a Christian hell and then described sure. it. We still wouldn't know, necessarily know that that is true or that you know th this isn't sufficient evidence to justify it. But largely, it, I tie it back to the alien abduction stories. I think what's happening there is you, you have a Muslim who had doubts and concerns about their own religion, heard about another religion, and this triggered a fear response such that what they'd heard, you know, some missionary comes through and says, you know, you're, you're worshiping the wrong God and you're going to end up in this particular hell and they hear something about it. And maybe years later um, has an experience. But the thing about near-death experiences, is, first of all, they're near death um, because death right. is a process. If you're dead, you just don't come back. I don't care if you're Jesus or whoever, you don't come back because, you know, he, he, right. Jesus was dead for three days. No, he wasn't. Uh, he, well, he was dead for part of three days. Well, maybe, but he came back and then he got to go be God. So it's not really a sacrifice, but the thing is, right. if somebody had had that experience and, and had never been exposed to it, that would be far more impactful. But it's not surprising to me that someone has had a near-death experience of a particular hell any more than it is that somebody had a dream about something. Because what's happening is, you have a brain that is uh, deprived of oxygen, that is in a dying state, and then eventually you get back to normal and there's this gap. And what Noah was alluding to is your brain has almost a, a, an uncontrollable impulse to make sense of that gap and construct a story. Now, we know that memory is incredibly fallible. 
that it changes over time, that our, our brains invent things. We fool ourselves all the time. And I'm not just talking about optical illusions and auditory illusions and hallucinations and things like that. We lie yeah. to ourselves mm -hmm. actively and then we come to believe them. So right. while those anecdotal testimonial accounts um, certainly should not be just dismissed out of hand, you, your the degree to which you should be convinced that there's an actual hell based on those uh, is zero or pretty damn close to zero. And it would seem to me that I try to take this stuff and put it in a, in a broader context of does this make sense? So let's imagine that the Christian God is real and that a Christian hell is a real place and there are right. millions of Muslims out there and a couple of them have had an experience where they described a Christian hell. Why, why right. is God cherry-picking a handful of people to give them this experience and not giving it to everybody? I mean, this is something... Well, can I comment on that real Of course. Quick? Um, I agree that this doesn't make any sense. As far, but the God is described as perfect in the scriptures, but maybe he is all-powerful and he describes himself as perfect um, and kind. But... You know, I think, well, what if he actually isn't, but that's just his law, that's just his ruling, you know, on things. Uh, that scares me. Is that, I didn't mean, maybe sure. I... Sure. How, how, how many other religions' hells do you find yourself scared of? Um, I think the, the, main one is, the main one is Christianity. Sure. For sure. Are, are you worried about other religions' hells? Um... Muslim, Muslims, so like just the Abrahamic, I, I guess the, the Judaism doesn't believe in hell. So I guess just the Abrahamic, Abrahamic Muslim and, and Christianity. And, and not anybody else's? Uh, no, although I'm not very well um, studied on them. Why, why do you think that is? Well, obviously I was born in the Western civilization. Sure. What if one of those other ones are true and you just aren't worried about it? It, um, I somewhat am, um, but... Okay, so then then it, it would seem to me that the next step is to try to figure out which, if any of those hells, you have good reason to believe are the real one. Sure. Um, and then try to avoid that one. Right. But what what if you find that there's no, there's no really good re way to tell which, if any of them, are real? Wouldn't the best course of action to be to just live an intellectually honest life and because it, if there's a hell and I don't have any way of verifying it or what I must do to right. avoid it or making sure that I'm right, then it would seem to me the best course of action is for me to live the, the best, most honest life I can and if some God yeah. wants to send me to their hell, it's not like I could stop him. He's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've tried telling myself that. It's pretty, I, I have... It. It's pretty painful. Uh, let me, let me that ask Noah real quick. Yeah. Did you suffer f from a fear of a particular hell? And if so, how'd you get past it? Uh, no, you know, I wasn't really raised religious. So when I was a little kid, I, I, you know, I learned about hell through Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know, and things like that. Sometimes there'd be little horns and sometimes there'd be little wings. And that was about all the hell I had. And of course, when I was a little kid, that was pretty terrifying, you know, in the same way that alien abduction might have been terrifying yeah. or something like that. But I wasn't raised religious. And I think it's really hard to get into the mindset of someone who fears hell if you're not. Right, I know. I know you came from a you were very uh, Christian for a very long time, and 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 obviously had that experience. Well, Mormons are are pretty different people. Yeah, I, I, that's a, for another time. But yeah. Oh, I've been to Utah. You are right. They are a very different people. <laughs> and, and actually, and actually, from a Mormon perspective, the fact that I was never a Mormon is probably to my benefit because once you're a Mormon and fall away. That's a completely different afterlife experience than someone who wasn't a Mormon. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, they, you, now in, in Mormonism, they have the, they, they don't have the same hell, right? They have the outer darkness is the Mormon hell? Out, outer darkness is, uh, is reserved, like, so basically Christianity, the, the, the main, in fundamentalism, the, the main uh, sin of disbelief, um, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you have until the judgment day to say that so very uh, to to say that you believe in Christ so very few people go into outer darkness 
And so there's the, I know this is going to sound crazy, but three kingdoms of glory, celestial, yep. terrestrial, mm-hmm. celestial, um, based off of um, how much you followed Christ and kept his commandments and such. I yeah. find it weird that Joseph Smith didn't bring that up in the Book of Mormon. I feel like he should have mentioned that. Um, I, I it, so, so you know, very recently uh, on our show, we we actually read the the Book of Mormon and broke it down chapter by chapter, book by book. And uh, sure. boy, I'll tell you know, I've read the Quran, I've read the Bible. I think the Book of Mormon may be the wackiest, um, and it's certainly the most boring. But there's so much of uh, you know foundational uh, Mormon. Uh, belief that is not in the Book of Mormon that you know gets added in the doctrines and the covenants or or the uh, what's what's the other one? I'm sorry, sure. the Pearl of Great Price. Oh, yeah, uh, the, uh, Price. Yeah, yeah. Once once Joseph Smith realized that this was working, you know, <laughs> and then he decided there were some other rules God also had. I feel like God could have put him in the gold plates. Well, and here's the thing: I that I that something like a distinction. I want to. I abhor a lot of the stuff um, that's been taught, especially by prophets by Brigham Young and um, just on African Americans and Mm -hmm. just awful, awful stuff that turns my stomach that, um, you know, but as a people, I just love the people. Um, but I do agree with you that it's all, it's an obvious fabrication. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's an all, all of this. And that, that's what added to my fear, you know, uh, is if this is a fabrication and then this is a, if this is breaking God's law, which isn't rational, but, if it is, then it is what it is. Then if I if I'm family. if I'm violating God's law, and that's going to be an issue for God, doesn't God sure. have some responsibility to let me know that in a way that I can be, you know, rather than At using like it a in a meter? Licensing agreement kind of thing that you have to click on and say I agree, something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't do any good for God to send Noah to me to say that he, you know, God told Noah I'm fucking up. Uh, it only really has any value if if god makes this clear to me Mm -hmm. sure well and there's also one other thing i'd like to address that you've kind of brought up a couple of times um in 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 your uh question which is what good people mormons are right um and you're absolutely right or or pretend to be i don't mean all right right no i i i no i understand um and uh, and i find and and i think you're right you know i i think by and large they're good people because i think by and large people are good people you know i i i meet you know i go to atheist conventions and stuff and i'm always wowed by what nice people they are what great people they are the vast majority of people are good people right and i think that religions very often use the inherent goodness of people to bolster their own you know their own philosophy right like if you're a jehovah's witness and everyone you meet is a jehovah's witness you're going to be like wow jehovah's witnesses are great people right but that would be true regardless of your religion or if you had no religion people are generally good people sure no yeah i agree and as far as like i would like as far as secular humanism i want i would love to dive full into that um, and I believe, like, I believe good people are, like, when an old man falls down on the bus, the instant reaction of people is to mm-hmm. get up and help that old man get back into the seat. I totally believe people are good, and um, and it takes years of abuse and darkness for someone to, to steer away from that. Yeah, that that's one um, path. There are, other, there are people who are just not good. Yeah. But, yeah. but by and large, I mean, and, right. it, and it doesn't even matter if... I mean, I'm always advocating for the notion that good is its own reward and life is its own reward and you can be good for the sake of being good. But it doesn't even matter if you're doing it for selfish reasons. Like maybe when, when the old man falls down the bus, I'm going to immediately help him back into his seat. Even if I'm only doing it so other people are convinced I'm a decent person, I've still done something good. Right. And, right. and you know, I might not need a motivation beyond that. Sure. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I really do appreciate you. And I... I, I I pre- I think I need to be rational about, you know, just the, just the amount of hells there are, and here's um, the, here's the other thing, Ben. This is where I was born into. Don't beat yourself up over the fact that you have some irrational fears. So does everybody else, sure. and the issue is how you go about discovering that and dealing with it, and coping with it, and, if, and it's not always going to be easy. Indoctrination is a particularly pernicious. Uh, process that can I know people have been atheists for 50 years who still wake up from nightmares about hell and then the, mm-hmm. as soon as they wake up they're like wow there's no reason for me to be afraid of that you know the rational mind kicks in uh, you're a human being 
and we're we're all right. flawed and fallible and and broken and awful and yet still generally good and a lot of this was stuff that was done to you and not not your problem so you know take it easy on yourself but keep asking questions and looking for the truth cool thank you so much and matt i'm a huge fan of yours so um i i watched a lot of your your uh I guess sermons. Well, then you'll be just fine. (laughs) 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 Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Good luck, Ben. (laughs) Yes. Being a fan of my work will make sure that you have a wonderful, fruitful life. No, not so much. Yeah, well, you know, it works for religion, though. We should probably try that. You know, at least give it a go one time. Please send all of your donations to uh, somebody. All right. Where are we going next? Uh, well, we have a deist on the line. Looks like mostly... Oh, oh, no, we've got quite a few good ones on the line. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, Cole's been waiting a long time here. Cole has been waiting a long time. So, Cole in Alberta, Canada, you're on with Noah and Matt. How are you? Hey, thanks for taking my call. I really appreciate you guys. Thanks. So, I really want to talk about the magical arguments. What I'm sorry, what? That? Uh, the, the cosmological argument. The entire category of cosmological arguments, or just like one in particular, like Kalam? Oh, uh, um, the one that the cosmological, so like the universe came from something, or like, or the universe came from nothing, kind of thing. So I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> yeah. So like cosmological, you know what I mean? cosmological is just a category of a number of types of arguments. There are a bunch of different cos- cosmological arguments for the existence of God. One of the most popular is the Kalam. And if I can knock that out real quick, we might be done. So the Kalam cosmological argument is premise one, everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore the universe had a cause for its existence. That's the Kalam cosmological... Sure. So if, if if you'd have written that down and looked at it, you will find that nowhere in that argument does the word God appear. So how can it possibly be an argument for the existence of God? Okay, but what is that? What caused it? As a, like, you know what I mean? Like something caused it, so what is that cause? What yeah, so cause? If, if we assume that the argument is sound and that the universe had some cause, your question is what caused it? Yeah. And if I, if I take that assumption, and I'm not necessarily convinced that causality works this way or that the universe had a cause, but even if I did, my answer is I don't know. Okay, but wait, so you don't know, or so you believe that the universe, or, or so, so what is your belief on, like, do you believe the universe had a cause or existence, or you, you don't believe it, or, like, what do you... I'm not necessarily convinced that the universe had a cause in that sense, but even if it did, I don't know what the cause is. Do you? Okay. Well, there's well, also... Assume... Oh, sorry, go What's ahead. That? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I would assume it's God, because there has to be, there, there's a cause, well, because I think it all adds up because God is non-existent. He exists outside of space and time. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> We may agree more than you think. So. If you're going to start with God is non-existent, we're all on the same page. Okay, so before, I, I'll let you finish your point there, Cole, but I, I think there's a little yeah. bit of an unstated premise hiding in premise one of the Kalam cosmological argument, that, that which uh, uh, came into existence. I'm sorry, what's, what's the phrasing of that? Everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Right, and we don't have anything that didn't begin to exist, right? right? So how can we start drawing distinctions about what mm. the rules for something that began to exist, other than God, right, which is what you're trying yeah. to prove with yeah. the Kalam cosmological argument. <laughs> so we've created a category of all known things and God. Right, and then we're trying to use that yeah. argument to prove the existence of God. That's not logically sound at all, right? Th- this is, by the way, how the Kalam came about. The, one of the original versions of the cosmological argument that was presented was everything has a cause for its existence, and then, of course, the response to that, well, what's the cause right. for God's existence? Right. And so then they changed it to everything that well, begins no, to that exist. that doesn't even make sense, though. What do you mean? Like, like I'm sorry to interrupt, but, like, it, that doesn't make sense to ask, well, what caused God? Because God is infinite. How do you know that? Part of the definition. Okay, it's, it's well, you can definition. define God however you want, but defining God doesn't mean that God exists. But, well, and also if we've accepted that something can be eternal and uncaused, then why can't that be the universe? Why do we have to have a middleman? Because the universe, you know, well, I'm, I mean, like, would you guys agree that the universe had a cause? 
No. Or was cause? No, we... No. You, you guys don't... You, you think the universe was eternal? Like how is, I'm, I'm curious, like how does that work? I, so depending on, depending on the definition of universe, if we're talking about reality, yeah. so you have multiverse yeah. ideas. That say, I, I don't see any problem with the notion that reality, the nature, the multiverse yeah. or whatever uh, isn't, isn't eternal. Timeless? Our local presentation of the universe mm -hmm. had a beginning. And we can only explore up to yeah. you know the Planck time prior to that, and then yeah. and so the answer is, hang on, hang on, Cole. Yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. My answer is I don't know, and you are convinced that the best explanation is a god, and in particular this god that you're defining as you know existing outside of space and time and all that yeah. stuff. How? Yeah, okay. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. Go when ahead. when we're looking for an explanation for something. The best thing we can do is list all the known candidate explanations and then pot potentially unknown candidate explanations. So of all the potential explanations, y you've landed on God. How did you rule out universe-creating pixies? How did you rule out well, a multiverse? I think it's most... Well, I think it's just most reasonable because everything... And, and this will sound physical. rude? Everything physical had a cause. This will sound rude? I don't care what you, what you think. I care why you think it. So the fact that you think that God is the most reasonable answer, ha, do you have any evidence okay. that there is a God or that the God is possible or plausible or probable as an explanation? Well, I think it's most reasonable, actually, because it's, I think it just makes sense. Like, everything I can see has a cause, right? So okay. Like, okay, but yeah, but you uh, can't see God and therefore God doesn't have to have a cause is what you're saying? Because because if that's the argument, then anything unseen could be the cause, right? Yeah. How many things have you seen? It's not just unseen. It's 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 part of his definition, though. It's eternal. Okay, but you can't define something into existence. So if you want to say that God is the most reasonable explanation, why, why can't I though? Well, why can't I? Say well, let me define here. leprechaun for you. Yes. <laughs> define. <laughs> Define Leprechaun. Define Voldemort. Hey, currently I'm surrounded by a hundred naked people. No, but these are but awesome. saying it doesn't make it so. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. Saying it doesn't make it so. Okay. But so what is the evidence? <laughs> what is the evidence that leads you to believe that God is a is an extant thing that is a plausible explanation for the origin of the universe? Uh, other than the definition of God. Back. Father, I guess we could look at Jesus and what he did and how he resurrected. How is Jesus relevant? No, 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 no. How is Jesus relevant to a God? Because it shows that there is definitely divinity. Like he was divine. No, was no. Divine. First of all, we don't even know that Jesus necessarily existed, but you don't just get to assume that Jesus was divine and then claim that that demonstrates divinity, which <laughs> demonstrates God, which demonstrates that God would cause the universe. I mean, you're going about this completely ass backward. I mean, there's a lot of connections you're going to make to come to that conclusion. I understand that. It'd be a lot to go through. Be <laughs> well, and the thing is, is that when you're to trying to make a logical that. argument, each step along the way has to support, has to be supported, right? So you're starting with an unsupported no, assumption. Okay. So when, when you, when you work backwards, especially when you work backwards from Jesus here, you are basically assuming what you're trying to prove and then working backwards to it, right? Well, let's do that. Let's, so rather than going a mythicist route, Noah and I, I, mean, I hang on, hang on. Sorry. I'm going to let yeah. you, you're going to get okay. plenty of time here in just a second. Noah and I are going to grant that the Jesus alluded to in the Bible or described in the Bible yeah. actually existed. Now, explain to us how this demonstrates that Jesus was divine and God. Well, because he claimed to be divine and he proved that through the resurrection. The How do you know that the resurrection occurred? How do you know the resurrection? I granted you that Jesus existed. I did not yeah. grant you that he was resurrected. Yeah, I feel like the yeah, fact that he said he was divine is a yeah. little... I mean, you know, Marilyn Manson... Or uh, yeah. Charles Manson but said he was divine. I, I'm sure Marilyn Manson said it too, probably. Yeah, but, but would you agree that would be good evidence to show that he was divine if he did indeed resurrect? Would no. Would you agree that that is no. good evidence? No. 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 Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'll go a step further. I will grant you that Jesus died and was erect, re resurrected. I do not, in fact, believe that this is the case, but let's assume for a moment that I'm convinced that okay. Jesus died and was resurrected. What is the explanation okay. for that resurrection? 
So is that what he did say it was true? That he's, he, like, would you agree with that? No, I'm a, I'm a magician. You think? I can tell you that I'm reading your mind, and I can give you evidence that I'm reading your mind, but that does not mean that I read your mind. Uh, I, I think I know where you're going with this, but uh, here, I'm trying to think. I got there. Like, what do you mean, where am I going? <laughs> this is the destination. That was the whole argument. I can Please. say I'm reading your mind. I can give you evidence that can convince you that you're re I'm reading your mind. But that doesn't tell you how I'm, I did it. Maybe I read your mind. Maybe I cheated. Right. So Please. even if we Please. grant, Please. even if we grant that Jesus Please. died, even if we grant that Jesus died and was resurrection, that does not tell us resurrected. That doesn't tell us how he was resurrected. That's something you would need to provide evidence I mean, for. Yeah, okay. But that's... that's and that's the most reasonable conclusion you can come to. No, no it's but not. It's not. Look, like, what, are they, what are the conclusions, though? Okay, like, have you seen Game of Thrones? This is argument from ignorance. Because John, yeah. John Snow was dead for a while, dude. So, like, y you know, it, th there are. I don't know of any other explanation, though. Okay, well, I'm but, saying that no but, other explanation. No, 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 no. Uh, that that is that is a fallacy. And here's the thing: if if you find a dead body in the room, okay. and you and you suspect that maybe the butler did it, and you can't come up with anybody else, does that mean the butler did it? No, that's what I'm saying. Though. Like, that I is exactly that. what you are saying. saying. That is that is exactly so what you're saying. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, if you can't think of anybody else, is it, hang on. If you can't think of anybody else, isn't it most reasonable to conclude that the butler did it? No, I'm saying I have good reasons. Like I can tell well, you. What are, that's what I've been asking for. Is what are the reasons? Cool. What are the reasons? Okay, so, so the five facts behind the resurrection, right? What five? So, okay, are you, are you going with with the minimal facts from Habermas? Because I've already addressed that. No, uh, these are facts that uh, I mean, I, I was I was listening to just a previous one, and you were talking about like how the Bible is not so true, uh, reliable, and stuff yep. like that. How I use these as, as facts or scholars, even you don't really care what scholars say. I, I right? care what scholars say. The <laughs> fact that a scholar said something doesn't make it true, right? Yeah, and, and that's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. That, that's, that's the kind of tough, that's the thing, because I think this is what... I agree. Like, this is the professional field to answer these kinds of questions. No, it's not. Like, no, it's not. No, it's no, 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 it's fucking oh, not. Oh, no, no, stop. You don't have to be an expert. It's, Hang on. I. You don't have to be yeah, an... Go ahead. E oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you do not have to be an expert in the field to assess the information and find logical fallacies. This is a key thing. If an argument is fallacious, that does not mean the conclusion is false. It just means you can't know that it's true. And so when I look at, I have access to the same facts that you do, as far as I can tell, and the same facts that the experts do. And that is, there's a book that claims that there was a guy who died and a day and a half later, though they call it three days, was resurrected again. There is no evidence physical evidence for any of this. But even if I were to grant that somebody who died and was resurrected, that does not mean I know how it happened. And to say, well, I can't come up with any other explanation other than God did it, even if I granted you that there was a God who resurrected Jesus, that still doesn't mean Jesus was divine because Lazarus wasn't divine, was he? Right. Was, was Lazarus, re Lazarus was resurrected as well, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We got, uh, I don't actually. Yeah. Yeah. So does that mean Lazarus was divine? <laughs> uh, because no. Well. Okay. So resurrection so, does not prove divinity. Next. <laughs> no, like, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of that. Like I don't have an answer for that right right now. Like, you know, I'm trying to think of that to okay. come up with an answer. Like I don't know how to respond to that. You know. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> but I'm not sure if that actually proves it, though, just because I don't know how to respond well, to that. Well, if it makes yeah. you feel any better, nobody has an answer to that. Yeah. So. I debated Mike Lacona on the resurrection. Mike Lacona is somebody you would probably consider an expert. He's written a book that's probably that thick on the resurrection. And do you know what Michael he did? Who? Mike Lacona, L-I-C-O-N-A. You can watch the debate. Do you know what his his case was for the resurrection? Ouija boards and floating gash can, gash, trash can lids demonstrate that there's something supernatural. And then the, the historical facts demonstrate that Jesus rose from the dead. That's it. Boom. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I have not heard of that one, no. Yeah. I don't even know what to think of it, actually. I'd give it some thought, I guess. But I mean, have you heard of it? Trent Horn. Of who? Trent Horn. 
Have you heard of Trent Horn? Trent Horn, yes. Uh, I've heard the name. Yeah, he goes in a lot of detail, too. I think he, I think he was talking to you about, like, I think, debating you sometime, eventually. Okay, <laughs> I'm good with that. that. But it'd be interesting, because he has some details about that stuff. I'm actually debating the resurrection, um, like, around April 12th, shortly before Easter. I'll be debating the resurrection online for free. For free? Uh, with who? Uh, like uh, or I think it's Mike. Or just in general. I think it's either Mike okay. Wagner or Winger. I'm, I, I apologize to Mike for not okay. having the name pop up quickly and easily, but oh. uh, it's going to be on the Capturing Christianity yeah. podcast. Yeah, no, I mean it, it's it's tough though because it's very like there's a, there's a ton of scripts, um, non-biblical and biblical scripts. Let, let me try this. Really, let me let me try this, Cole. Like, yeah. Would you agree that the resurrection? is the single most important fact within Christianity. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if the resurrection didn't happen, then all our faith, faith is in vain. <laughs> That's actually... So here's yeah, the thing. Exactly. Better have happened. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So let me, let me get this question. If you were God, and you set up this weird system where you came down and took human form and sacrificed yourself to yourself to serve as a loophole for rules that you created in order to save people, and this was the most important fact for anybody on the planet to know. Do you think yeah. there'd be any chance that this would be any more debatable than whether or not when I drop my phone, it's going to hit the table? Why, why is it that the most important thing is recorded in books where we do not know the author, we cannot investigate eyewitnesses, in languages that, that have but died... Hang on, hang on, in languages that we have died... Mm -hmm. that have, that have died out and changed, and we have no ability to investigate it, and yet this is the most important fact that people need to consider, and the fate of their eternal future rests on what they think um, of it. And, and keeping in no, mind that I, God I, knows what's coming, yeah, so he I, knew we were going to invent video cameras and stuff eventually. It's right? amazing how miracles decline yeah. as the ability to record yeah. them increases. But, I mean, yeah. it's not, well, you know, the okay. Gospels, you have no idea who even wrote them, let alone no ability to talk to them. I would disagree with you. I think we do know who wrote these. I think we... You, you are... Ab no, 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 Cole. <laughs> Cole, Cole, I'm yeah. going to stop you here and do you a favor. Go out and Google. I mean, no, no, stop. Just don't say anything for a second. Go out and Google and do some research because the, the thing is, this is not remotely controversial. As a matter of fact, if you pick up a Bible and open it where there's a cover page over like the book of Matthew, it will flatly say, we do not know who the author of this is, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were names that were ascribed to the book as a matter of church tradition. New Testament scholars, including sincere Christian New Testament scholars will tell you that you are flatly wrong yeah. when you say you know who wrote the Gospels. So before you keep digging in on things that you absolutely know nothing about, just go out and do some research because I debate all the time and I debate some of the greatest minds that, that Christianity has and some of them are great people and wonderful people that I like, okay? But yeah. if, you, if I'm going to state a fact like we do not know who wrote the Gospels and you come back with I disagree with you and think we do, you are doing a disservice to your religion and to your argument and everything else. And I would rather, I don't want this show to be a parody of Christian arguments, people who don't really know that much about this. So all I'm saying is go out and research some of this stuff because right now you're in knee-jerk mode. Right now you are in, Matt said something that is a real problem for my beliefs, and so I'm just going to deny that it's true. <laughs> when, in fact, the authorship of the Gospels is unknown. Okay, well, even if it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily come to, or I don't think that you should come to a conclusion. It doesn't actually, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, it Wait, nope, sure that don't. Please, please finish, please finish that. Uh, what's that? So you're yeah. saying that so even... I don't think it necessarily means that the resurrection didn't happen. It's I didn't say that. You know, I swear, if this, if is, is, this is the problem, Cole. I swear yeah, I'm trying no. to... Cole, I, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I am Sorry. doing you a favor. <laughs> Because I never yeah. said, never said or implied that because the authorship is unknown, this means the resurrection did not occur. I didn't say anything remotely like this. As a matter of fact, I never said the resurrection yeah. did not occur. I'm saying we don't have evidence to conclude that it did occur. And even if it did occur, we don't have evidence to conclude what the best explanation for it is. So now you are engaged in a straw man yeah. of something I never said. You are embarrassing yourself over and over. And there's no need to do that. Here, here's a Bible. 
Uh, this okay. is the introduction page. This is the introduction page to the book of Matthew. And the first, and I haven't even read this one. I don't even know what version of the Bible this is. It says, author. Nowhere does the gospel name its author. Though the title, according to Matthew, was probably added early in the book's history, most likely around the beginning of the second century, second century, the book was not quoted as Matthew's gospel until Arrhenius, Bishop of Lyon, did so around AD 180. Now, this is the Apologetics Study Bible, Christian Standard Bible from Holman. I'm not coming up with shit that is just atheists say stuff to make theists look ridiculous. This is Grab your own Bible. Go to Google. None of this okay. is remarkable well, at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, can, can I move on then? To, uh, I, I think. The I think we. I, I think I'm going to do you an extra favor, and Noah and I are going to move on to some other callers. Go look into but some of. The, no. Go look into some of this stuff okay. and call back. We're here yeah. every week, and also you can call Talk yeah. Heathen. Those guys would love to talk to you too. And if and if the first thing you but say and if serious. and if the first thing you say is I had a conversation with Matt, and I wrongly accused him of saying things he didn't say, and I was mistaken yeah. about the authorship <laughs> of the Gospels, and I would like to continue the conversation. Everybody here, probably yeah. including myself and and Noah, would be happy to continue, but I'm not going to today. Okay. No, um, cause okay, cause I mean, I mean, I was just curious, like if oh, if, you, if you want to answer or not, it's okay. But I just want to know, like, what you think, how the universe came together, kind of thing. I was also just curious I already told you at like, the beginning you of this call, kind of I don't know. Just don't know. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry oh, that I you're know, uncomfortable okay. with that answer, but sometimes it is in fact the right answer. It's just uh, yeah. What did, okay, I I for, what did I have? What did I have for? What did I have for lunch today, Cole? I don't know. <laughs> That's the right answer. Thanks. Well done, sir. Well done. Sometimes you don't know. Yeah. Well, and what it cracks me up so much is that I don't know is such an intellectually honest answer, and it's always followed up, oh, well, then what I'm saying is true. It's also the only answer that keeps that, that doesn't prevent you from finding the actual answer. Yeah, right. Because, right. hey, what caused the universe? God. Well, you're, you're done exploring. <laughs> Congratulations. And you'd think even if you believed in God, you wouldn't want to go that route, right? Like, obviously, like, you know, it, 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 Cole's big problem here is that he hasn't really looked into this. He's discussed this with other Christians. He said, you know, why do atheists think this, et cetera, and hasn't done the research such that when he actually presents these arguments uh, to an atheist, he's hearing the response for the first time. Yeah, and this is why, you know, I, I've been doing this show for almost 15 years, I think, or 14 years, something like that, uh, and we've had calls on everything. And I really want to make an effort moving forward to make sure that... I know that some people's favorite parts of the show is, Matt laid the smack down on some stupid Christian who said terrible things and rah, rah, rah. And I know that those make the highlight clips. That is not my favorite part of the show. It is not the reason that I do it. Uh, I, it's about education. I want to know stuff. I want... If people have good arguments and evidence, I'd like to know it. But when you come up with the same old things and then... You twist things in your head to where, well, I don't think that should make you conclude that the resurrection didn't exist when I said nothing in the ballpark of that. Right. No, all you said was it gives you no evidence. So you say, what's the evidence? He says this. You discount that evidence. And he's like, well, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And it's like, Correct. no, it means you have no evidence. Yeah. It's it's like, it. I, I maybe it happened, but you haven't made your case. The fact that you can't make your case does not mean that I'm wrong not to accept it. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, quickly, I mean, we've got uh, 15 minutes until the show is supposed to be over. Whether or not we're going to go overtime, I'm, I'm going to leave that mostly up to the guys in the back and Noah, because uh, I'll stay here for like eight hours. Uh, <laughs> but uh, quick announcements. We are here at the Atheist Community of Austin's Free Thought Library. And I know I mentioned this at the outset that any atheist or atheist friendly person is welcome to come down. Uh, today, this place is packed. There's no parking anywhere around. There's just loads of bodies who are uh, laughing and clapping and nodding and everything else. And after the show's over, we have like a dinner social thing here. There'll be food here. Um, if you're not, if you're in Austin and you're not currently down here, you can, of course, try to come down. But we're here every single week, uh, or pretty much every single week. And this is becoming a 
proper community center where there's a lot more going on than just, you know, Matt and Noah are going to argue with people or uh, we're going we, we're going to do a show about parenting, we're going to do a show about sex, we're going to do a show about all those. Stuff. It's a real community where people are actually working together to do a lot of things. Uh, if you are one of those secular individuals who is feeling that you're alone, and this is something I've heard the entire time I've been doing this show, that I'm the only atheist in my hometown. No, you're not. Unless you live alone in your hometown, you are probably not the only atheist. In some cases, when I hear from people, there's actually a community already there. In some cases, there have been organizations that have regular meetups and podcasts in that person's hometown, and they just don't know it. Do a little searching, reach out. You can start by going to some of the national organizations, American Atheist, uh, Atheist Alliance, Freedom from Religion Foundation, uh, Americans United for Church State Separation, which isn't a secular organization, but... Through those, you can find local affiliates and find an organization in your area that you can participate with. And if you are someone who cannot, for whatever reason, go out and interact with people in public and do those things, there are online resources for you. And we live in an era where I can pick up this device or almost any device I have and be communicating with another human being and see them face-to-face -face if I want to and, and they want to. Um, there's... I, if nothing else, I'm not saying if you're alone, it's your fault. I'm saying that there are avenues and ways out where you don't have to feel alone, including organizations like the ACA. So if you're feeling lonely, do a little bit of searching. Reach out to somebody else. If you can't find it, just post the question on, I don't know, Quora, some site where people will answer questions, and somebody else will do it for you because we want people to participate and we don't want anybody to feel alone. I know what it's like to be the, the lone atheist in a family full of religious people or a community full of religious people. Um, and by the way, what goes on here, it's exactly what you think. We just stand around going, hey, good job not believing in that God guy anymore. <laughs> okay, hey, good job. Oh, you don't believe in God either? Oh, yeah, that's, that's all we do. No, it's not all we do. There's so much more uh, to atheists in the atheist community uh, than just congratulating ourselves on getting the correct answer to what is literally, I think, the easiest question in the world. Right, and, and also I know a lot of people are standoffish about this thing, uh, about doing these types of things because they're not good socially, they're socially awkward. If you're socially awkward and that's what's keeping you away, believe me, you'll fit right in <laughs> in the atheist community. So. Or, or you will not fit in any less than yeah, most of the other right, people right, there. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, I just got news from the, the studio. So we have all six lines are full. We are going to stop taking new calls, but all six of you who are on hold, we are going to do our best uh, to get to all of you, even if we run past six, as long as Noah's willing to do it. Sounds great, man. Perfect. Sounds great. Pick our next one. All right. Well, Timothy uh, has... A, <laughs> the notes on this are, are exciting. I'm really dying to hear this argument. Timothy and Peoria, you are on with Noah and Matt. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, uh, Matt, I also really appreciate your show because uh, I feel like you give a pretty adequate response to kind of steel man the atheist argument to actually better uh, have conversations with people whom I don't necessarily agree with, but it's always interesting to at least get their worldview. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, basically, I guess my position is more along the lines that uh, I think the Orthodox Christian worldview has uh, more explanatory power to for reality than the atheist worldview. I, I think that's a pretty good summation of my position. I, I think um, I would agree, what? but I would change the wording. Okay. Be because I would agree that it is... The, the atheist worldview makes no attempt to explain reality. Right. And the orthodox Christian view does make an attempt to it. The problem is I don't think that it has any explanatory power because we tend to explain the unknown in terms of the known, and Christianity attempts to explain a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. Okay, so what, uh, so what you're saying is from a more natural, like methodological naturalistic standpoint, you would say that it's more of a uh, either not trying to explain the things that can't necessarily be understood or trying to explain the things that can't be understood by the things that we already know. I'm not limiting it to method methodological naturalism is the, the foundation of science and reason, and we're stuck there until somebody demonstrates that the supernatural is real and that we have some way to verify when the supernatural is causing something. I'm not ruling out supernatural causation. I'm saying that before you can posit a supernatural cause, 
you have to actually demonstrate why that should be considered a candidate explanation. And so far, nobody's even come up with a way that they could possibly demonstrate that the supernatural is a candidate. Okay. I, I see what you're saying. Okay. So then with that, I guess, because obviously the Christian worldview takes more of a, I guess, metaphysical approach to the way in which we understand and explain the world. Um, but in the same way, even with methodological naturalism, don't you still have some, I guess you could say, abstract or metaphysical concepts that have to be presupposed to take yes. that route? Yes. And, and, the, and the goal um, here is to presuppose as little as necessary. Like, in order for me to have a, any sort of conversation with somebody, I have to presuppose that we share an exa- a reality and are able to communicate. But that is, that is the necessary presupposition is the fact that I can't demonstrate that I'm, you know, maybe I'm making you up. Maybe I'm, I I can't get past the problem of hard solipsism. I think there are potential solutions. And and one of them is that at time zero, somebody describes a fact about the universe that I don't understand and I'm unaware of. At a later time, they explain it. And at a time after that, I get to a point where I understand it. And yet, after I understand it, I can go back and see that it was also the case at time zero before I understood it. And for me, it's far more plausible that I am, in fact, sharing a reality with someone who knew something I didn't and explained it to me than that I am engaged in a sort of schizophrenic self-deception of teaching myself something and or manipulating time so that it was also true in the past. Got you. I mean, that's that's just a really good argument against any sort of, uh, uh, I guess, being closed-minded in any sort of meaningful fashion. I mean, that was really well said. But um, thanks. With, with that in mind, though, I mean, so saying that you try and keep the things that you presuppose to a minimum when, uh, I guess, trying to better understand reality. I mean, you still have. So with that, what? I guess with God being, I guess, the main ontological basis within the Christian worldview, would you say primarily reason and um, logic and basically uniformitarianism are the main concepts that are presupposed within methodological naturalism? I wouldn't even presuppose uniformitarianism. Reason. The, uh, acknowledging that reason is reasonable and that I, I share a reality with the people that I'm communicating with, that's probably about as far as I'd go with, with presuppositions. I think every, uh, as far as I can tell, everything else can be derived from that. It's not that I'm necessarily opposed to even... I mean, you could presuppose that there's a supernatural realm as well. I just don't see any justification for it, and I see plenty of good reasons why that's a bad idea because throughout human history, every single time we have tried to answer a question by appealing to the supernatural and have later found out what the actual answer is, it's never been supernatural. What, um, what is your operating definition of supernatural? Not natural. <laughs> so not, not either... Yeah, not, not, just, not just spooky movement is distance or weird, stuff like that. Like magnetism. Uh, sorry, Insane Clown Posse. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's weird and maybe we don't completely understand everything about it but it's something we can investigate and explore and uh, there's nothing within the natural world that would preclude the natural as an explanation and so when we look at something like you know how did the how did earth form well we can study the formation from data and investigation we can't these things take far too long for somebody to just like observe start to finish but we know of uh, stellar explosions that create an accretion disk where the matter and gravity and collisions form to eventually become planets and planetoids uh, things like that it's not it doesn't mean that there isn't a god who physically formed the earth it's just that there's no reason to suppose that or consider it as a likely explanation given the available facts until such time as somebody demonstrates that there is a God and that he can actually do something like this. So essentially it's everything that's matter or anything directly derived from matter? Well, I mean, 
matter and energy. I mean, the, the physical things within the universe, uh, I don't know that there's anything beyond that 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 we could say exists. Certainly, you know, we could talk about abstract concepts and stuff like, you know, three. Um, but when we're looking at the world and we want an explanation, like I was saying earlier, we would list known candidate explanations, and then we would also include uh, unknown candidate explanations, provided there's a good reason for it. And, and you don't get to say this is the best explanation until you demonstrate why this is the best explanation. And the fact that the Christian worldview has at its core this entity that is sufficient to explain the universe doesn't mean that it's necessary and sufficient to explain the universe. Because it's indistinguishable from me from saying it's magic or universe creating pixies did it. How do you tell between those which one is more likely? I mean, would you um, would you agree to, agree to some extent that if, if one were to make an argument for God, it would have to essentially be a multivariable analysis of all the possible evidences for the God, and then you basically have to compile whatever evidences there are no. and see whether it actually makes the most sense to no. believe that that God exists? No, Here, here's the thing. This is real simple. Okay. I have no idea what would be necessary to demonstrate that a God exists. I don't. In order to have that kind of knowledge, I would either already be able to do so or be God-like myself. I don't know what, what would be necessary. It's like saying, what evidence would be necessary to prove to you to, that ghosts exist? Because how do you rule out alternative explanations? It would need, I don't know what it would take. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying nobody's done it and nobody's come up with a mechanism and a method by which you could do it. So simply saying, hey, I was in bed and I woke up and there seemed to be this apparition in my room and now I believe in ghosts, I understand why you reached that conclusion, but I don't agree that that is necessarily a reasonable conclusion. So I, I don't know what it would take to prove that a God exists. But I'll tell you this, and I've said it countless times before, some people in the audience can quote along with me, uh, if there's a God, that God absolutely knows what it would take to demonstrate its existence and has not done so, which means that God either doesn't, doesn't exist or doesn't want us to know he exists. But doesn't that also presuppose that uh, there's some sort of necessary determinism with a God that exists in that sense that doesn't necessarily allow for uh, human freedom to choose if they would not want to necessarily, say, spend eternity in heaven with him, then he would allow for that fact. And no, 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 Timothy. So what you're doing is you're saying essentially that if God revealed himself to us in a way that was conclusive, uh, we would no longer have the option to not worship, right? Uh, no, 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 that's not what I said. What I was trying to say is like, uh, essentially if, so if God made it clear enough to understand that he exists, but not so clear that one could still, I guess, find reasons uh, of their own volition to not believe in him because they don't necessarily like him or disagree with the uh, moral standards that have been set up by him, that they would still find a way to justify it to themselves. So, but do you think those people can fool God? No, but that's not so, what I'm So like if, I, if God reveals himself to me in such a way that it's clear and now I am convinced there's a God and I really don't like him, but I understand that he can squash me like a bug, so I decide to play along, do you think that's going to work? No, and that's no. what I'm saying. Okay, so, well, it is. If you play, all right, I don't want to say that necessarily that is. So, and I, I, I don't want to deprive Noah of this, but I want to get to this point. Um, what if God were to reveal himself to me right now such that I had good, reasonable, uh, evidence-based conclusions that there was, in fact, a God, what would be the problem with that with regard to this paradigm of me and my soul and afterlifes and all of that? Well, the, I, again, I think this, this is, in a sense, putting ourselves as finite beings in a place of infinite knowledge. And I no, don't no, 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 no. I'm asking what the problem is. I'm asking you what you think the problem is going to be with that. Okay, can you, can you just repeat it one more time? I'm, I may have just misunderstood. Sure. God could reveal himself to me right now in such a way that it would be 
uh, I would have a good, reasonable, fact-based conclusion that God exists, correct? Uh, well, I guess from my position, I would say that uh, there's already a good, reasonable... Uh, I, uh, I okay. swear I'm going to hang up. <laughs> so he's try we're trying to establish a precept here, man. So I, all I asked was, okay. is God capable of fucking revealing himself to me clearly? And if, uh, if you think yeah. that he already has, then the obvious answer is yes. Yeah, I don't care yeah. if you think he already has. You are wrong. You are wrong that God has done so to me. I'm asking if he can. Yeah, I'll I, give you a hint. He's omnipotent. Maybe. No, I, but, I said yeah. Sure. So God can. Why? Why is it? What are the possible reasons that God has not done so? Now, you can say that he has, but you would be wrong because God has not revealed himself to, to me in a way that is conclusive. But God could, do, could definitely do so. Like, no matter how, no matter how much I don't want to believe in God, because I know that's what a lot of people think or anything else, it is undeniable that God would be capable of essentially forcing me to have to accept that he existed, right? Yes, but what, just what, to clarify, what would be the problem with it, with that? Um. I, well, and this is the thing. I don't think there's necessarily a problem with that, but that's. Then again, why hasn't sure. he done it? And this is again where where what I'm saying. I think you're misunderstanding my point that I was trying to make. My point was basically along the lines of. Just because he could do something doesn't mean that's what he sees as best. Correct. And just because I could feed my kids doesn't mean that, I'd, that I necessarily think I'm going to. But if I don't, that's my responsibility. Not my kids. But I just don't understand, you know, like God doesn't give me the option to believe or not believe in this coffee mug, right? Believing in this coffee mug is so much less consequential than believing in God. You know, this is a proposition for which I can spend eternity in hell. Right. And, and yet he's going to be all, you know, coy about his own existence. But the existence of gravity, the existence of magnetism, the existence of coffee cups, he has no problem throwing those out. Also, of course, in the Bible, he has no problem whatsoever depriving Moses of this. Right. He shows himself to all the Israelites uh, under Moses and then and then they don't believe in him. Right. And so, Saul. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there are so many uh, cases, if, if you follow Orthodox Christianity, where God has deprived people of that. But that was, I mean, and you see this time and time again throughout the the Christian scriptures where they literally say that one hardened their own heart and then God basically affirmed them, affirmed them in their hardness of heart. I can, harden, yeah, while, I can harden my heart as much as I want and I cannot stop believing that that coffee cup is sitting right there. I can pretend that I don't. I can dislike the coffee cup. I can refuse to do what the coffee cup tells me to do, but I can't stop believing that the coffee cup is there. One can, I mean, and people do this. People do believe things uh, contrary to what all common sense would say. No, um, no. Believe. What you're talking about is you have a good reason to believe something and you are convinced that somebody else has the same good reason to believe it. And when they don't, you're going to accuse them of hardening their hearts. Stop pretending you can read people's minds. That's I do it much better than you do. I, I was saying the heart, I was talking about from a theological standpoint. I wasn't talking I understand. about from a practical standpoint. Well, it, um, it also says that God, God himself hardened Pharaoh's heart. So he just kind of took away his free will. Pharaoh wanted to let him go, but God hardened his heart. But that was after three other times of Pharaoh saying, I mean, where it said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Yes, there are times where, where it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But what that, do, that doesn't mean that Pharaoh said, you know, that miracle I just witnessed that I was convinced was from God. I'm no longer convinced of that. It was, I don't care. I'm not going to let those people go. But then when he did enough little uh, atrocities to convince Pharaoh and Pharaoh was again ready to let those people go, uh, God said, no, 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 no. I'm not done showing off yet. I'm going to harden your heart, and now I'm going to kill every firstborn. Good God. And regardless, if, if, he, if, if Pharaoh made the wrong decision four times in a row, like the, the, then it's okay for God to take away his free will, whereas it's not okay for him to take, take away mine or yours? Or, or maybe we don't have any. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that he took away his free will. I said he affirmed him in his hardness of heart. Okay, so we're way off track from the from the thing, and yeah, we're we've, we've got definitely. like five other callers. So the thing is, only question I'm asking is, 
clearly God could make it such that it was impossible for me to not believe that he existed, right? Yes, but I, again, hang, I, that... Hang on. Okay, go ahead. That has not happened. And your response is that God has revealed himself to everyone. I'm just, what, in denial? No, that's not what I'm saying either. Okay, well, then why what is it, is, why, why don't I believe? What I was saying is that he allows for people to choose not to believe him. and he. You don't get to choose your beliefs. Beliefs are not a choice. He allows people, even right, scripturally. Right. I agree. You, even scripturally. Right. I know I'm absolutely right. Even scripturally, <laughs> it's not about choosing whether or not you believe. It's choosing whether or not yeah. you follow and worship. That's the choice. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I completely agree with that. So if, the, uh, if that's agree. the choice, what is the problem with God just appearing to everyone, stop playing favorites, make it so that everybody has a good, we all even agree that we have a good, like we all, who's the president of the United States right now? Oh, why'd you have to bring that up? Because it's great. Why did you have to bring that up? So <laughs> is, there, is there any informed person on the planet? I would say that the overwhelming majority of people on the planet, given access to the facts, would all acknowledge that Donald Trump is president of the United States right now, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And yet that doesn't tell you anything at all about whether or not I think he's a petulant child douchebag, does it? No. It doesn't tell you whether or not I, I care what he thinks or says or whether or not I would follow his instructions or anything else, right? No, so, but I mean... So the fact of... Re there's nothing about God revealing his existence clearly that is problematic or for both the, the Christian paradigm... Or with regard, why are we even, why isn't this something that we could not dispute? Like, we, we could, why is there even any reasonable way for someone to say, you know what, you haven't made your case? And then the response is, well, God's revealed himself to everybody. He's, he's put it on your heart. His, his works are evident, his unseen things in the things that we see in reality from Romans. That's, I mean, that's based I, I think that's kind of a straw man of what I'm actually trying to say, though. What okay, I'm, I'm going to get point was, instead instead okay. of all that. Then uh, let's let's hit a quick reset. You tell us exactly what you want to say, and I'm I'm going to stop talking because I'm likely to run down forty rabbit holes, and I'll let Noah address it, and then we'll move up. Okay, uh, I guess my main point was your one of your points. Well, I guess one of your questions was about him revealing himself clearly. And why wouldn't he do that if he wanted us to know him? Uh, correct? Like, that was one of the main points. Well, even, even regardless of whether he wanted us to know him, why, why wouldn't he do that? Okay. 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 Well, and this is where I would, and I know you'll disagree with this, but this is where I will say that he, I would say he did in the person of Christ. And there is evidence in the first few centuries reading through the literature. Okay, so let's go to the first few centuries and check that evidence. If that's okay. not possible, then there is no evidence, right? If you and I can't go examine the evidence, there is no evidence. Well, there's no, okay, I wouldn't say there's no evidence besides the historicity of Christ and the claims made from Christ. However, okay, claims are not evidence, though. Those are two completely different categories of things. Oh, you're right. You're right. I guess claims might have been the wrong word to use. Okay. The, the weight of the existence and the things that were beyond explanation that happened at that time. Uh, but, okay, so in order for me to accept that there are things that happen that are beyond explanation, I have to agree with your conclusion, right? You're trying to get me to agree with your conclusion. This is a circular argument. By the way, if, no, thing, if things are beyond explanation, then you can't propose that there's an explanation. I just want to throw <laughs> that in there. Good point. Hey, this is unknown, right. and I know what it is. That's ridiculous. Let me, let me clarify Beyond naturalistic explanation. Right, right. Sorry. But there is no evidence that anything without a naturalistic explanation happened unless I agree with your conclusion. Not necessarily, no. Okay, so what is the evidence that something that can't be explained naturally happened? Other than claims, which we agree are not evidence. And go for two, because we got callers to go to. Just no more than two. Okay. Uh, I would say some of the pri uh, two of the primary things would, and I know you've already talked about this this hour, uh, would be the resurrection and the, I guess, 
the unique nature and novel nature of that after three days and even details okay. that were laid out about him being stabbed in the side with water and blood coming out, which we know shows that this person who was being attested to actually died on the cross. Or, 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 um, that, or that the person writing about it was familiar with crucifixion or death or well, stabbing people. That's, but that's, uh, that detail, to throw that in there, isn't isn't inconsequential. It's not like they necessarily knew that. Like, but, right, right, right. But, but wait, it's wait, not wait, like oh, the no, no, only no. way they could have known that is to watch Jesus specifically be stabbed on a cross. Are you suggesting that nobody knew that after you run out of, out of blood, you bleed water until Jesus? No, no, no. I'm, so we I'm knew that beforehand. That and so now you're, are you saying that they only included that data because it actually happened and not just because they possibly wanted to convince people it happened? I mean, do you, are you saying that they knew that that was a sign that the person had already died back then? That they're, uh, Well, that it they're doesn't say that it's a sign that the people already died back then. It just simply says that it happened. All it would take is someone at some point having observed that happen. And of course, we all agree that Jesus wasn't the only person ever crucified or stabbed in the side with a spear. Right? That's been going on for quite a while. This was a known yeah. thing about human beings when they die. At that time? Yeah, yes, yes. People had stabbed people before Jesus. No, no, no. I'm, I'm asking about the specific details about the water and the blood. Right, right. But, they, but it, that is not presented in the Bible as proof that he was dead. It's simply an observation that exists in one of the Gospels. Exactly. And it's an interesting observation considering they didn't necessarily have that knowledge at the time. Holy what? shit. <laughs> I literally just asked you this fucking question. <laughs> I literally just fucking asked you if nobody knew about bleeding water until Jesus, and now that's the game you're playing. Goodbye. Oh, man, we got really close to coffee cup denialism in that one. That I, I am not going to spend the bonus time with a guest uh, with people who aren't going to argue, honestly. Pick another one. Much appreciated. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, since we both have so much background in astrophysics, how about, uh, how about we take this call about the Big Bang from uh, Khaled? All righty. Khaled in Toronto, thanks for waiting. You're on with Noah. Hello, can you guys hear me? Sure yeah. can. Hi. Uh, so first of all, I want to say thanks for taking my call, Noah and Matt. Uh, so I've been a big fan of the show. Uh, I've been watching since I was like 13. Thanks and, for making uh, me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm 19 now, so... Oh, right, um, not that old. Yeah, so... Um, uh, the fact that I was already doing the show for eight years before you started watching it is funny. I've, honestly, it's been a good eight years, honestly. So uh, I turned into like somewhat of an atheist when I was uh, 15. Uh, and I started like questioning um, a lot of like the uh, Big Bang Theory. Um, so I know your stance on it in particular, but um, I was just wondering... Um, so the Big Bang Theory has a lot of like unknown variables, meaning we don't really know where the universe came from. And I, I'm pretty sure you said that in an earlier call as well. Mm -hmm. um, so would it not be rational to make the argument that um, since uh, the universe is expanding, obviously, uh, it had to have uh, started from a singular point. Uh, isn't it rational to say that um, there, there should have been a mover or, or someone to uh, initially start that? No. Uh, expansion, no? No, that would not be rational. It, because physics breaks down just before we get to the point of a singular... Also, uh, none, I have a friend who's a physicist who's looking into alternate cosmo uh, cosmologies that may eventually, and the data, if the data seems to bear out, may give us a completely different view of the Big Bang. Big Bang cosmology is merely, this is the best current explanation of all the available facts. However... There's a point at which the math and the physics break down, a point at which we cannot explore beyond that and cannot make declarations about what is or was or what caused it. Certainly, there has to have been something that accounts for the transition from the things that we can't explore and don't understand to the local presentation of the universe that we have, but we have no idea what, what that is or could be. Uh, right, so to say that someone needed to uh, to move it, or e even something needed to move it, um, is is making a huge assumption that that it can't have caused itself. Right, like there are there are uh, theories within Big Bang cosmology that time, causation, etc., all began with the Big Bang. In which case, it would be in it would be logically impossible for something to have caused it. Yeah, it, it, if there was no time before, then there 
causal actions are temporal. They require time. Right. However, I will say, um, I'm not in any way denying that it is reasonable for people to infer a mover uh, because yeah. because what they're doing is extrapolate, extrapolating from what they know and understand and applying it to this other thing. The problem is, right, is that right. I don't know what the justification is for applying what you know about X to something that is well, not can I X. Tell you the justification? I'm sorry? Could sure. I tell you the justification? Sure. Please. So if... So I like, like I'm, I would think I'm a pretty rational person and like I go about things logically. Most so people do. If, yeah. So if we're, um, if we're observing the universe and everything we know in the universe, uh, everything that was made originally had a cause. Um, and I'm not saying that, um, like I, my beliefs specifically, I, I believe that it was like, there was an initial mover, but I don't believe in like, like the Christian God, like, oh, they're watching mm -hmm. over us and, one of the problems is that you just said everything that's made. And so made is a a very, I don't know, weaselly word because we don't have any reason to think that the universe was made. Right, again, that's what you're trying to prove. Right. Every, everything to that's, that's come into existence. Do you have any Can example of anything that has not come into existence? Okay, so I saw your, you said uh, we don't have it. Um, if we don't have an example of nothing, uh, Sorry, could you fill the blanks? I remember you made this statement, so, and I had an answer. Yeah, if if we don't have any examples of a thing that didn't come into existence, we can't thereby, thereby draw conclusions about the nature of a thing that didn't come into existence. And, and it's worse than that, because w what my objection is, let's assume for a second that there is all of this which came into existence, which we're not necessarily sure that that's true, and then there is something else that did not come into existence. So now we have X is these things that came into existence, and not X are things that didn't come into existence. We have no examples of not X, but even if we did, my objection was that I don't know what the justification is for extrapolating facts about X and saying that they apply to not X. And so even if there was something that didn't come into existence, I think it would be clearly, obviously a mistake to conclude that because uh, this fact about X is true of X, that it's also true of not X, and that's not the case. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I can understand that view as okay. well. Um, so I, I just have another quick question. I, I know you guys are running out of time. Actually, technically, the show should be over, but um, uh, so I'll make this quick. Uh, okay. So if you, so how do you, so I think it's impossible, first of all, to prove the existence of a God, um, I which agree. makes it like, which makes it a really like, I would really say currently like, impossible. Currently, well, we don't know if right. any means could ever be... Like, like we don't know how that, to that's why I added the word currently. It, the, the situation yeah. may change. I'm not aware of any way to demonstrate this okay, now. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, that's fair. Uh, so I was just wondering, like, so evolutionary-wise, um, how do you explain the need for like humans to constantly wonder where the universe came from? Like, How does that help us um, on an evolutionary scale? And also, if our thoughts... Oh, that's easy. Yeah, I was going to say, are you asking how curiosity helps us from an evolutionary perspective? Uh, I guess so, yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like you can just kind of look around at human inventiveness and that sort of answers itself, right? Learning about the world benefits us. And being curious about things that we don't understand is exactly what that is. At one point, we didn't understand electricity, and now we have a better understanding of it. Um, yeah. So we, we are an inquisitive species and we benefit from that because it teaches us about the world. The fact that there are questions that we can't currently answer and may never be able to answer uh, is not surprising because we ask questions. Right. Okay. That, that makes sense. I'm yeah. just asking that question because, mm -hmm. um, so my parents are very religious um, and I grew up in a Muslim household, uh, but I was always like skeptical ever, like since I was a kid. Um, and Every time I was skeptical, my mom would tell me to like look outside, you know, look at the trees, look at, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that would just drive me crazy because it, it didn't really explain anything. Mm -hmm. For what it's um, worth, though, that's the that's the one that the Quran keeps going back to again and again, right? Just trees, mountains, yeah. rain. And, and yeah. side note, side note, I apologize for this. Going back to the no, to the 
previous call about nobody knew about blood before Jesus. It reminds me of the things in the Quran where, like, uh, it describes a fetus. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Describe it, yeah. As, as if nobody had ever seen a fetus. <laughs> right. A bunch of agrarian people who were raising and birthing animals had never <laughs> yeah. seen a miscarriage or a fetus. No. And nobody's ever cracked an egg and been surprised by what was inside of it. It's just bizarre. Yeah, and also the, there's a thing about... Um, uh, the Dead Sea or a sea separating in the middle, so something like that. And uh, oh, right, the waves beneath the waves uh, argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I was always skeptical. Like I don't, I don't believe in any of that stuff. But I just like I can't seem to knock the like I, I constantly because I, I've been watching this show for a while, and I was an atheist for like a long time, but I, I just can't seem to rationally think about like, like. Um, I think I think it's a human issue as well uh, that mm -hmm. we we don't want to believe that we came from nothing, tough, or that there's no uh, purpose, right? I agree yeah. with you. I agree oh. that 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 it is difficult. You that, know? that is a de that it is a de desire. I'd rather I I'd rather believe that I'm loved. I'd rather believe that somebody cares about me. I'd rather believe that somebody has my best interests at heart. Actually, okay. Adam Savage. Uh, I would Savage rather believe quote. that uh, uh, Matt is uh, Anna Kendrick. Right? Yeah. Okay, but, but couldn't I couldn't I then say um, if you would rather believe that you want to be loved, uh, isn't that sort of a religious belief? No, it's a desire, and what I care more about than whether or not I'm loved is what the truth is. So I'd rather not have cancer. I'd rather uh, be convinced that I don't have cancer. But whether or not I have cancer is not impacted by how much I don't want to have it or don't want to acknowledge it or don't want to believe it. And so there's a, another preference of mine that is going to take priority of that, which is I'd rather know the truth about whether or not I have cancer. Yeah. So I was just, uh, I was just saying because um, I'm not saying they're necessarily right, but um, I think religion first spiraled forward because uh, it sort of gave people uh, hope moving on. Yep. I gave something people to like cling onto. And uh, I know you're really um, skeptical about like uh, religion in everything. classrooms. Yeah, well, a lot of things. Well, yeah, everything. Basically. I want comparative religions taught in classrooms, and I don't think it should be an elective. I think it should be a required course. Um, right. Amen. So my, my question is, if, if you, if people find um, solace or if they find meaning or purpose in their life following a religion, is that morally wrong or morally bad if they don't impose it on anyone else like my mom for example she um she's a a, a muslim like to the core does she vote but, yes she does then she's disqualified from your claim that she's not imposing it on anybody else because what you believe in fact informs your actions and your decisions and when you vote on behalf of those things you are effectively uh impacting the rest of the world i don't believe that there's any belief that one can truly hold that has no impact on any other belief or anything else i think there's some yeah. that are less harmful Right, but the problem with that is you're sort of like you're you're supposing that your belief is the right one. Correct. My belief is that theism has not met its burden of proof. Yeah, right. Now keep in mind that it's not in itself unethical or immoral or wrong to think that your belief is right, especially when your belief is right. Right, like so if, if all the evidence agrees with you, if, if believing what you believe is the best explanation currently available in the universe, then it, it's not, it's not close-minded, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's not um, uh, detrimental in any way to then say, yes, this is the way things are, right? Uh, right. The, 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 you know, the, the alternative to that is that we all get our own realities and obviously, you know, we can't function as a society like that. Yeah, also like that, that was another thing as well. Uh, like the, the whole idea of, of an afterlife and, and that sort of- That'd be awesome, it, wouldn't it? It would be really awesome, but it's, it's really, it doesn't really make sense, but- Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and until I have a reason to think that there is an afterlife, my primary concern is always going to be the one and only life I know I'm going to get because I'm living it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, that was that was my biggest question. So when I came out to my mom about like these beliefs, um, what I told her was, it, so if if I'm a rational thinking, I, I'm pretty sure I got this from you, Matt, a, a long time ago. If I'm a rational thinking uh, human being and I abide by um, what, what I believe are good moral values. Uh, I live my life um, 
you know, doing doing well, treating others with with good uh, intentions, then it's like, isn't it morally uneth or not unethical, but um, isn't it immoral to then um, subjugate me to eternal hell uh, if I just don't believe? Yes. And, yeah, and that like that that's what I had told her, and she didn't really know what to say. Um, so she just kind of well, just like. Especially yeah. when you consider what Matt was saying earlier about the fact that you cannot choose your beliefs, right? Like if I decided right now right. that I really, really wanted to believe in God, I can't. That's not how yeah, beliefs that's work. exactly what I told her as well. Mm -hmm. It's like she, she would try to get me to, she, she would never impose a religion on me, but um, she would uh, ask me to pray and how she, she would feel um, like it's an out-of-body experience when she's praying and she feels really like connected with God. And it's like, I told her if, if I'm praying and I'm not, uh, reciprocating those feelings, then it, does my prayer really count? Right. Well, and also I get that same feeling when I eat mushrooms or take LSD. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make it a, yeah. You know. Like, it's all subjective, all the feelings. Mm -hmm. It's like how you describe them. Some people say God, some people say, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was basically all I had for oh, sure. Well, all thanks right. a lot for calling. Uh, you know, we really appreciate it, especially people who waited all the way through yeah, so the lengthy right. show. Yeah, yeah. We got two more calls I want to get to, but uh, call it, go ahead and call us back sometime. You know, always room for more questions, and don't forget about the other shows like Talk Heathen and stuff like that. Um, yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. All right, we have two calls. We're going to get to both of them. All right. You're going to pick the order. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I uh, Joe is calling about something that's very near and dear to my heart. So. Joe in Arizona, thanks for patiently waiting. No problem. Matt and Noah, thank you for taking my call. This is awesome. Noah, can you guys hear me? Sure can. We can't when I hang up awesome. on you, though. Noah. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. Uh, Noah, uh, that, that uh, uh, godless movies, uh, uh, god-awful movies, that sounds awesome. I can't wait to check that out. Um, the reason why I'm calling is Matt, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was before Christmas, you had a, on the atheist debate, on one of your uh, atheist debate videos, you, at the very end, you said, and that leads us to atheist in foxholes, and that's a video I'll do later. Yeah. yeah. I, whether you've done that or not, I haven't seen it. I haven't. Uh, and I haven't. Then, and then at the beginning of this show that you showed a, a, a screenshot of a, a magazine that said atheist in foxholes, it's okay to think. And so my question is, is there in, uh, in the secular community and religious community in, so, in society outside of the mili military in civilian world, uh, is there a preconceived notion that in the military we are simply automatons and don't have the ability to think? No. Okay, so where the uh, <clears throat> where the whole uh, there are no atheists in foxholes thing comes from is this idea that when the bombs are falling, we all return to Jesus and start putting our hands together and pray, right? Uh -huh. um, and this is fallacious in fifty different ways. My my uh, argument against this is normally like, look, if if you were truly theistic, right, and you were in the foxhole and the bombs were were dropping, you'd be standing there going, oh, I hope they get me. I am so ready for heaven, right? But instead, you put on a helmet and you duck down and everything, which leads me to believe that there are no theists in foxholes. I'm totally stealing that for the video I'm doing oh, on this, it. by the way. Have at it. Uh, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about my background and why I, I, put, I said that I, am, uh, I have some uh, insight on this. I've been in the Army for 22 years. Uh, currently, for the last two years, I have been an instructor instructor at uh, Advanced Individual Training, AIT, specifically unmanned aviation. Um, what I teach is basic electronic theory. And in Wait, if, it, if it's unmanned, who are you teaching it to? <laughs> Good call. The maintainers, the people who actually yeah, take care it's, of it. It's amazing that it actually takes, is this correct that it takes more people to operate an unmanned uh, aerial vehicle than it takes to operate a, a manned one? It does. That is true. Yeah. That's fucking job security right yeah, there. Yeah, right, bro. right. <laughs> it is. It is absolutely. So I'm a maintainer, and and I teach the maintainers on how to fix this stuff. In my class specifically, one of the very first things that we go into is subatomic particles. Now, when you tell that to soldiers or to people like you, you probably go, "What does subatomic protons, neutrons, electrons have to do with flying an aircraft?" 
No, because we work very closely with the electricity. Now, I don't want to get, get too far off topic here. My point is that we teach critical thought and problem solving. And what, and we push on the soldiers that it's not, don't just take what I'm giving you, question it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ask why we're doing this. And with this new generation of millennials, every generation that has come before the millennials has operated primarily on the how question. How do I, how do I accomplish this mission? How do I accomplish this task? Millennials, because of technology and delay, no delayed gratification and what have you, they ask the question, why? And if I, as a leader, can answer that why question for them, they can figure out the how. Yeah, let me, so, let me jump back a half a second. I, I think we're in a position where everybody realizes that, of course, people in the military think. I think that... You, Noah was pointing out about the atheists and foxholes thing, and I, I think he kind of nailed that. Um, one of the areas, though, is that critical thinking is great. I'm woohoo! I'm glad you're teaching some people critical thinking. It, but the truth is, as I was in the military for eight and a half years as well, there are situations where nobody nobody can ever stop you from thinking, but there there is a, a perception and a reality that. Um, you don't get to not follow orders and that there are certain things where your thoughts are irrelevant to the actions that you're expected to carry out. Okay, you are correct in that. That we did. We all swore an oath when we when we joined the military. We raised our hand and we, that oath says, "I swear to uh, uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to obey the orders of the officers appointed over uh, the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me." Absolutely, that yep. is there. That does not mean you have to follow the orders. That doesn't mean that you don't. How, that you can't question how the orders get followed, get carried out. And actually, you absolutely can. And actually, this is something we should point out. You are expected to do so in the sense that you are not re not only not required to follow an illegal order, mm -hmm. you are expected to not follow an illegal order. So there is still thinking. Correct. Yeah. You absolutely are absolutely right. I as far as the bombs. So to go back to what Noah said earlier, when the bombs are, are falling, you don't you don't sit down and start praying and go, oh my God, no. Or when and for specifically in my well, field in aviation. Well, I sure hope not. Yeah, it wouldn't make you a very effective soldier, huh? Yeah, when people are firing at us, I want people firing back and <laughs> yeah. not on their knees in prayer. Right. So in aviation, we have things called logbooks. This is where we keep the information of the aircraft. Before a pilot in manned aviation or before an operator in unmanned aviation even thinks about flying, they go and check the logbook, and then they double-check it. And any work done on an aircraft is done and then double-checked. And before every single flight, there's, there's check marks that you have to go through and a checklist, and you say, hey, I did this, 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 and this. At no point in any regulation that we have does it say, did we sit down and do the prayer? <laughs> right. has, has God blessed off on this mission? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are people doing that, but it's not part of the, the checklist. Right. On, on that note, Joe, uh, they're starting to put tables together in the other room. I want to get to the one last call. I appreciate your time. And uh, yes, Absolutely. I'll do that video on Atheist and Foxhole soon. Excellent. One more thing, Matt. Yeah. As a person who's in the military, who, uh, who struggles with weight loss and what have you and staying in shape, presumably that you wanted to lose the weight, you're looking good, brother. Please. Thank you, up. sir. I appreciate it. I've spent the last two weeks um, at weights that I haven't seen since 1994. So, oh, wow. It's Pretty cool. Congratulations. We have one last call we're going to get to, and on the off chance that, I don't know how this is going to go, there's a couple notes that I wanted to make. Number one, uh, today we were 300 viewers short of the all-time high number for live views for oh, the Atheist wow. Crew. So you were very close to setting a record. Oh, come on, 300 just, people. Just by showing up. They have the Spartan Army is all I needed. And literally, during this last call, if everybody who's watching it can go out and get a friend and say, hey, just click long enough to watch this last call, uh, we would set a new record by, like, orders of magnitude. Well, not be, at least doubling. Um, lastly, uh, well, I'll do this afterwards. We want to get on to... Uh, is it Aram in Houston? Yeah. Thanks for waiting. You are the final caller for this special episode with myself and No Illusions. Uh, have at it. Yeah, I need to thank for keeping me for the last, actually, because I don't feel pressure for anybody. Cool. So, uh, 
Let me ask first question, then we can elaborate maybe a little bit. You guys talk lots of religion related conflicts mm-hmm. and but I didn't hear actually I discovered you guys recently, I can say for five months ago. Uh but I didn't hear much about what do you think about deism or agnosticism? Mm-hmm. Oh, deism and agnosticism. Um Yeah. So I, I, I think you'll get a slightly different answers on agnosticism from me and Matt. So let me just start with deism. I don't see that deism solves anything. I feel like you're, you're basically at a certain point just adding a layer for the sake of adding a layer. It doesn't give you any more explanatory power or anything like that. Uh, so I feel, I feel like deism uh, just fails Occam's razor. Um, agnosticism is, is a bit different. I mean, I feel like we're all agnostic to a certain degree, right? Yep. So whether you're an atheist or a theist, I guess there are some theists that would tell you they have zero doubt, and that's probably not quite true. But I think we're all on some level in the in the agnosticism spectrum, right? I agree, despite Noah's expectation that I wouldn't. Oh, okay. Well, we, we, we could get deeper into it and find yeah. a disagreement. I'm, I, 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 I'm fine, you know, depending on your definition of knowledge, I'm either a Gnostic atheist or an agnostic atheist, and I know that Gnostic atheist doesn't make sense, so I'm probably not that. But... Uh, on the deism thing, I, I'm in, in agreement with Noah, but I go a step further, and that is, so deism is the notion that there is a God, perhaps as a first causal action, but, but basically the, the, the thing is, deism is a belief that there's a God that does not interact with reality in any way. And that, to me, is the very definition of absurdity. Because you are claiming that you can have a rationally justified belief in something that does not interact with the world in any detectable way. That is an absolute failure of skepticism. And quite frankly, it's often, from my view, proposed as a, oh, I don't want to say there is no God. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want to be in a position where I'm saying, hey, I don't believe there is a God. So I'll just go with this God that we we can say nothing about. We, 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 have, we can confirm no property of a deistic right. God. And if there's something that for which you can confirm no properties, why would you ever believe it? Yeah, an, an ingredientless sandwich is not a sandwich. Yes. Hey, this sandwich doesn't have bread, doesn't have cheese, it doesn't have mustard. It does, what does it have? I don't know. We can't tell anything about this sandwich. Then how do you know there's a sandwich? But I think this is a kind of... Um initial perception on that definition, which is you are taking uh, the God definitions which we were told. No, no, I literally just described and deism as belief in a God that doesn't interact with reality. I'm not taking a definition of God that I was told. That's what deism is. Okay, Okay. Well, what, what if I say the, something uh, sparkle the let's say Big Bang and then uh, I, then I would say how thing. do you know that and how do you know what it is and no, why would I'm, you call it I'm God telling, I'm telling so the, the, the first explanation uh, from Noah was the deism doesn't explain anything so I'm, I'm telling that it explains the starting and then no it doesn't he is on vacation it, it, it's he not an explanation on vacation since then <laughs> no I mean it's, no, it is, it's not an explanation. Couple, it is an it is by definition an unfalsifiable, untestable assertion. Exactly. When, when I understand that, your point. No, you don't. No, you no, you don't. Stop for just one second. If I ask my mom why I should do something, and she says because I said so, that is not an explanation. It has not edified me. It has not given me any understanding at all. It is just an assertion. Yeah, I'm just coming. Couple previous calls, there was a discussion about there was no clarification what caused the big bend, and they were, they were and you, you guys were talking okay. about so we don't I- know, and since we don't know, we cannot say something. That. Correct. Well, right. We, there is and that's why deism that. is ridiculous. Well, and so, and here's the problem: it's not just ridiculous; it's also problematic because. It may not be that it's always the case that we can't explain this, right? We we don't we as we know understand it now, we can't explain it. But 
if you if you call it God, if you start giving it any type of name, if you if if, if you assert what you're asserting here that God sparked the Big Bang and then went off and 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 you know hang out in celestial Acapulco for the rest of his life, what you've done is you've closed off a line of inquiry without actually answering the question. Yep. And and the and the follow up question is how do you know that God sparked it and then pissed off to vacation land? Mm -hmm. You don't. And so you're claiming to know something that you simultaneously acknowledge you can't know, and that is the definition of irrational, or is definitionally irrational. Yeah, that, that, I mean, I know, I know that is the definition of irrational is this is, but there is also, uh, you know, let me let me come from uh, the background. So I I, I, I don't. I was born in Tur Turkey. I, I don't. I was born in Turkey, and I, I've grown up in Turkey. Aram, and, you know, Aram, yeah. your background, as much as I'd like to talk about it another time, is irrelevant to this. Do you know what I had for lunch? I, I know no idea. <laughs> w wouldn't it be silly for you to to acknowledge that you don't know what I had for lunch, and then just say, "But I know you had something for lunch." Wouldn't Wouldn't that be kind of yeah. silly? Yeah. That's what deists are doing. And by the way, I had nothing for lunch. <laughs> yeah, I had nothing either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, we've been working him like a dog since he got here. So. And, and I'm actually hungry. And because of all that, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a fork in this call and the show. I appreciate it. Call us back another time, and I'll, I'll happily listen to your background and why it might Thank be relevant you. to a God thing. But right now, it's, it's not. I, I appreciate the time. Now... First of all, thank you, sir. This has been outstanding. Come back and do it again sometime. Absolutely. I'd love to uh, hang out. Thank you to everybody who showed up so much. And if the guys in the booth can wave at folks and show that they did all the actual hard work to make sure people could watch the show, we greatly appreciate it. Come on down, find your local community, and stop shaming sex workers, you puritanical, pearl-clutching jackasses. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah.